Welcome to the Awaken Ireland Show on TNS Radio. I was out there on Monday, the 14th of May, 4,709. That's in Chinese years, but here it's 2012. Um, Paul and James here from Awake in Ireland. Welcome to our show. Good it's morning. Our, it's our fourth show. And um, James is going to now give us a summary of what's on our show tonight. Good morning, everybody, and you're very welcome again this week to the Awake in Ireland radio show. It's uh, show four, and we are absolutely delighted to be again broadcasting live from Tremor in County Waterford. Um, again, we have an action-packed show where many different speakers, we have pre-records and we have a live telephone interview as well. Uh, the first uh, person we have live on the show is Alan Boylan from Awaken Dublin. And uh, Alan Boylan did a public survey where he travelled on the dart and he also uh, went to shopping mar uh, markets and uh, different places all over Dublin to discuss uh, different ideas about Ireland's future with the general public. And we'll be getting Alan on very shortly to discuss his findings, very interesting findings uh, in, deal in relation to his survey. Uh, after that, then we have uh, Clara Lara um, from uh, Waterford, uh, Awaken Waterford, and uh, Clara has been very busy in organising the Project Awaken uh, event that's happening on the 16th and 17th uh, of June this year, and uh, she's been very, very busy in getting uh, the best speakers possible to be available. Uh, to speak, including Vinnie and uh, Harry of TNS Radio and many others involved from TNS Radio and further afield, uh, as well as people from uh, the UK and uh, possibly America as well, which are not confirmed. So we'll have Clara talking about that uh, very shortly. Uh, Paul will do a segment on the fiscal treaty also, uh, because uh, we don't really have to you know, explain the reasons why you shouldn't vote. I think most people know themselves at this stage that you know, to vote yes is to uh, basically uh, disempower yourself and your family for generations to come, Paul. Absolutely. Ben Gilroy is up then after that. Ben Gilroy was talking to me this morning. And uh, again, as we know, Ben is very, very busy traveling around the country. Uh, ben is giving us an update on the, the recent events happening. Uh, also, uh, an exchange you had with a receiver uh, there recently, and he's making a video out of that, Paul. Cathy Sinnott is up after that. Um, we have a lengthy interview with Cathy Sinnott in relation to uh, UN legislation. Um, children's rights ch legislation? Children's rights legislation, Paul, yeah. And uh, it's actually very, very frightening. Uh, the way they've wrapped it up in, in, in lovely words and terms. Uh, very deceiving indeed, Paul. Package, absolutely, yeah. And uh, she's going to break it all down for us. And not only that, but she's actually going to explain how the EU Parliament works because she, as a lot of people know, that she was MEP for South of Ireland for uh, many nope. years. Uh, and that's pretty much what we got on, on in, in store for you tonight. Action packed show again. And uh, we're going to get on the phone now to Alan Boylan. And while we're about to do that, we're going to play a little track from Billy Joel. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much, James. Alan, uh, Alan, you've been very busy lately there. You've, uh, I mentioned the Bog Hill, uh, first of all. Yeah. And um, we, we had a couple of chats down there, and uh, you went off and, and did your own thing then up in Dublin and decided to set up a, a questionnaire as well. Well, it was my own personal uh, point of inquiry to find out what... Because you're reading all this stuff off the internet, and you don't know what's true and what's not true. And you said to yourself, well, listen, the only point you can do is go out, to, out on the streets and speak to people personally, you know? Yeah. So I wrote up ten questions. You know, the questions were described as anti-government and leading. And after reflection, I said to myself, well, maybe be were in a, in a bit. But I was just going off questions. I'm not a professional at doing any sort of questionnaires at all. But I said, I'll go out and ask questions that I thought was relevant to what I wanted to know. Yeah. Well, I was surprising the results, being honest with you, you know? Oh, I had um, ten questions. Mm -hmm. One was, do you think that ordinary Irish citizen has a voice in Europe? Okay. And the result of that was, out of 242, was that uh, was 71 percent says no that they didn't think they had a voice. Wow. Oh, sorry, 70 percent says they didn't think they had a voice. 
24% says yes, that he, he did have a voice, and 6% were undecided. Now, a couple of the answers I got off people was, when I asked the questions, I said he didn't care. Mm-hmm. Uh, nobody ordinarily has a voice. Uh, yes, our government speaks on our behalf. I have them all lying out here on the floor in front of me. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. One person says, no, but what if a social welfare to be awarded in this country? Okay. One person says, uh, no, small co- no, small country, small voice. Mm-hmm. I said, there was, there was a load of different things, but I said before, uh, 70% of the public, about 242 people anyway, were, were, weren't were comfortable with it whatsoever at all. Yeah. So that's a big finding, that, isn't that it? That speaks for itself, and anyway. The it, it second ca- question was... Yeah, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead. The second question was, do you think the bailing out of the banks was the only solution to the country's problems? Uh, 71% of the people says, no, it wasn't a, solu- it wasn't a good solution. Uh, 20% of the people says yes, and 9% was undecided. Mm-hmm. So there's public opinion again, it's in favour of not bailing out the banks, you know. Yeah. Uh, some of the answers to that was... Well, some of the answers were really bad, you know, which I can't even speak to my live radio. Now, hold on. Recapitalising the banks was a good idea, but the payback to private shareholders was no. Um, one person says no, it was criminal. Another yeah. person says it was a disgrace. Private business, private failure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Another fellow says it was a disgrace. And someone says, no, I think we had other options, we just weren't allowed to choose them. Mm-hmm. Oh, there you go. Very and interesting. I was surprised... As it says, people's intuition is right. Mm-hmm. What well, it says before, what they're voting for is wrong, kind of, you know? Mm-hmm. So, number three was, would you like to see a broad range of solutions to crisis up for public debate, rather than having solutions imposed on you? And 95% of the 242 people says yes, they would like to see more solutions. And I thought that was encouraging myself. 95%. That's very encouraging, yeah. actually. Alan. That's it. Now, as I said before, have you got a, a people? Have you had ten thousand questionnaires for now, and if people ask that question, uh, what sort of that, that get in the mainstream? No problem at all. Yeah. People want to see more solutions. That's that's the thing. We, we're not given the solutions. So there you go. And anyway, but number the, the four was: had, uh, Do you think it's right for the government to deal with national assets and sovereignty on the international bond market as collateral for private debts? Now, I got the earth torn off me for that one. Could you repeat that Someone one, please? Said, Sorry? Could you repeat that last question? Do you think it's right for the government to deal with national assets and sovereignty on the international bond market as collateral for private debts? Now, I don't even know whether that question was right or wrong to be asking, but someone said that was an old question. It didn't count. That's what you, you weren't doing that at all, you know? Mm. And now, as far as I'm concerned, they're selling off forests and oil reserves and the people aren't getting that now, over. Mm. Absolutely. You know? Now, uh, number three was, do you think handing more control to Europe is the only solution to saving the country? Hold on. The result of that was, 84% says no, that wasn't, and 16% says yes. There you go, there's another. How does that make you think? Wow. Well, it's just going unconsciously. Mm-hmm. And we with the flow of things. Mm-hmm. People are just too self-absorbed to actually realise what's going on, you know? Yeah. All right, number six was, uh, do you think it's right that unelected bodies of elite banksters get to dictate how much money is in the world, how it gets shared out, and what interest is repaid? Um, the result of that was... 88% of people says no, and 12% of people says yes. Now, what we thought was too big of a question to ask, you know? Mm. Well, at the exact same time, people really don't know how, how things are working out there. Having a clue. Having a clue. And uh, number seven was, would you not agree that an internalised monetary system within each country and governed by each country would be a better solution to economic reform? Now, personally, I think that'd be a great idea. We need the control back in this country. We need our voice heard. You know. Yeah. But yeah. But at the same time, that was a, an even split. It was 52% in favour of going back to an internalised monetary system. 48% of people said no. Now, it didn't reflect the, rest, the, the answer to the other questions I got, but the next time, that's what people says. Yeah, that's a shocking one. Uh, you know. well, there you go. 
Yeah. Um, Does it make more sense? You know, if number eight was a pretty simple notes. question. I says, do you trust politicians? And I think 85% of people said they didn't trust politicians mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. And anyway, yeah, the last question was, what's the biggest problem in the Northern State today? And what everyone says, well, most people says uh, politics mm-hmm. and corruption. Wow. Um, and I also asked, do you know anything about Iceland's solution to their crisis? And the answer to that was, hold on, 74% of people said no, and 26% of people said yes. So wow. there you go. And if someone says to me that the same that what happened in Ireland is not the same thing that happened in Iceland, and mm-hmm. I said to myself, it was. It was corrupt officials, backhanders, overpriced houses, cost of living was too high, and everything just claps in on itself. And the same thing is happening over here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, that, that, they're the ten questions in anyway. Brilliant. Okay. Well, wh- what's the next step for 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 the, that research that you've collected? Well, what, I, what I'm hoping to do really, is get more people involved, and I, I'm willing to get ten thousand questionnaires printed up and I'll distribute distribute them to volunteers that want to do it. Mm-hmm. Now, if you ask three yes or no questions, yeah, that have factual factual evidence behind them. That you're not, you're not leading or anti-government. That people can accept, the general public can accept the question and go, oh yes or no. And if we ask the right questions, mm-hmm. we'll have a voice. We'll have a bigger voice, and we put a v, the voice in back of the in in back in the people's hands, you know. Yeah. So I was I was going to ask people if they wanted to put up a question on the Wake and Orden uh, Facebook page, and maybe if they wanted to volunteer to contact me, and I'll con- contact them back, and we can organise something bigger. Okay. Fantastic. What's your contact Fantastic. details there, so? Uh, well, you can contact me. Well, as I said, the Wake in Ireland uh, website you can go to, uh, mm-hmm. or else you can contact me on Allah Boylan, A L A B O Y L A N at gmail dot com. Mm-hmm. Or Awake in Ireland at gmail dot com as well. Yeah, it's uh, the information that gets me. At least that way, at the end, they always hoping to get it done before the referendum. But exact same time, it like, wasn't enough time. There wasn't. Well, stranger things have have happened, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you're you're thinking about organising organising an event as well, isn't that true? Yeah, up in Barbrigan. I was in with a the hotel there, the back in court in Barbrigan. So he says to me that I could hire out the room. Well, to give me the room free for the public to pay. I was going to uh, invite all the councillors down. I've listed about forty councillors. I was going to ring them down and get yourself, James, down and do a bit of public speaking. Sure. And a couple of other lads like Ben, ben Gilroy or so, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. And so we, can, we can talk about them. Between us all, we can hear the yes and no stories of it, you know. And we can ask questions that are, are evident that, that we want to know, you know. Absolutely. It's all about grassroots, isn't it, really, at the end of the day, the day Alan? You know, it's about... Uh, Sorry, I didn't hear you there, James. Sorry. It's all about grassroots, and it's about sitting down. And this is it, James. If you get out there in the street and you ask the que- questions, we'll open in public perception as well. Yeah. They'll start asking questions as well. And if you get a self-survey of 10,000, it will be great. Because we'll, we'll have a real survey, and we'll have legs to stand on, then, and we'll have a proper voice, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's so vital that people realise that even though they're individuals and they're out there... And they're you know they're busy in their daily lives and they're trying to uh, get on with things and they have all these ideas exactly. going around in their head but they feel like well the, what what can I do because I'm not part of uh, any party political movement or I'm not part of the government so how can I possibly it's, it's have a voice? We're you know the Awakening Ireland movement is non-political. All we want to find out is the truth. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And offer solutions. Exactly. Exactly, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so you yeah so wait, 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 any ideas when what sort of dates are you looking at then for that or next couple of months or well listen to me I'm unemployed now at the moment myself and have four kids so I'm pretty busy at home the the wife's out doing a little bit of part time work so we find it hard to find the time myself but like if other people are willing to put a time and effort in I'm willing to put a time and effort in you know okay well let's put a big shout out there for anyone listening to uh, to offer their help to volunteer to help Alan there. Um, get get this event up and running, you know, and help with the, the continuing surveys. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And, and it's Allah Alla Boylan. Well, as well appreciated. And it's Allah Boylan at gmail dot com. Allah Boylan yeah. at gmail dot com. Okay. Lovely job. Okay. Well, thanks very much, uh, Alan, for taking the call tonight. 
And, uh, no worries, no worries. It's way past my bedtime. I'm usually yeah. in bed for about half nine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here with paper all over me, sitting on the floor. <laughs> and hope to get an update from you very soon, Alan. Yeah, no worries. But listen, that keep up the good work. You're doing a great job. You're hard, you know. Sooner or later, we're going to crack something. Okay. Yeah. Well, you can get those stats out then to uh, to Tracy, Tracy O'Connor, and we get them up on the website ASAP, and then we can we can keep building on that. You know. Yeah, no problem at all, yeah. All right, bud. No worries, James. Listen, keep up the work. I'll talk to you soon, Paul. Thanks very and much, Good night Alan. to everybody out there. Okay, good. <laughs> take care. Cheers. Good right, luck. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good luck. Just a quick uh, thank you very much to Ronan and Dee for the fantastic night last night down in Wexford. And greetings to all the info warriors down there and everybody else. You know who you are. Good evening, folks. Hope you're tuned in. Yeah, and I hope, you, I hope you had a great 40th birthday there. Uh, and uh, we will see you all soon. I, unfortunately, I couldn't get down there. I was I had something else on here in uh, in Waterford. I had to attend to myself. So we're talking to Alan Boylan there of Awake in Dublin, and as he explained that he was involved uh, with a public survey, and he wants to increase uh, the catchment area by uh, going out with a thousand questionnaires, and uh, he wants help with that, and he also wants help with uh, an Awake in, the next Awake in Dublin uh, event that he wants to organise soon, but he, he realises he can't do it alone. So if anybody out there is looking to help or can help, please contact uh, awakenireland at gmail.com or ala boylan, A-L-A-B-O-Y-L-A-N, at uh, gmail.com also. And uh, he'll be delighted to have you on board, Paul. OK, we're going to play another song here, and then we're going to go into the next segment uh, of the show, which is uh, Clara from uh, Project Awaken from Awaken Waterford and she's going to fill you in on all the details of the Project Awaken which is on the 16th and 17th of June in Dooley's Hotel in Waterford it's a Saturday and a Sunday it's a two day show folks that's correct and uh, we're going to go ahead there now and play that segment this is Clara talking about Project Awaken and in studio we have Clara and Clara is part of the Awaken Waterford team and Clara uh, has been organising uh, the uh, Project Awaken conference. Is that right, Clara? That's right, yeah. Okay, Clara, why don't you start there by letting us know the reasons why you decided to get involved in the Awaken movement? Are the mics okay, up? James. Well, um, first of all, the Awaken Waterford group, uh, we could only reach out so much to people in the local area. Okay. Um, and the big problem we found was people weren't aware of a lot of information, so uh-huh. they weren't drawn to come to the meetings. Sure. So I decided that it might be a good idea if we could get speakers from around the country Tracy and further no afield uh-huh. to talk about different 32. topics. No. Yeah. Um, just sent it. And it would be providing an information um, gathering for people to come and get involved. Uh-huh. They can also, especially for cynical people yeah. who who want to discredit certain topics, uh-huh. it's an opportunity for them to come along and listen um, to the speakers. And if they want to get involved in the debate afterwards yeah. or raise any questions, they can uh-huh. get them answered from people who have actually researched uh-huh. These topics. Absolutely. Um, okay. Well, it's, it sounds great. It sounds like a great idea, and I know you've put an awful lot of work into it, Clara. Um, can you give us a rundown of who to expect at this event and the date? Yeah. Well, it's uh, on the 16th and 17th of June, um, which is the Saturday and Sunday. And the list of speakers confirmed so far is uh, first of all Nigel Grace. Uh, he's uh, coming over to speak about the Bosnian pyramids. Uh, okay. It's one of the top archaeological discoveries of the century, um, mm-hmm. but it's getting a lot of um, bad press. Uh, people are trying to debunk it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the problem there is that uh, there's uh, a lot of scientific discoveries after being made um, and uh, people just aren't interested. Uh-huh. So uh, I, thought it was <laughs> I thought it was a good idea to get him to come over here because at the moment there's only talks going on in the UK. Yeah. Um, and it's an interesting subject for people to learn about in Ireland. 
Uh-huh. Um, the next topic is uh, sovereignty, and we have yourself speaking on that. I'd be talking about that, yeah. Um, uh, there might be one or two others. Um, they uh-huh. have to be confirmed. Uh, then we have Thomas Sheridan. Um, there's a lot of people aware of him. He has a few books out um, on psychopaths that run. Mm-hmm. Labyrinth world. of a Psychopath and Defeated mm-hmm. Demons. I was talking mm-hmm. to him there last week on the show. So that's another interesting one. Yeah. Barry Callahan. He did a talk uh, for the Awaken Dublin. Mm, good event. old Barry. Very, very funny guy. Yeah, and he's going to be speaking about life after death, uh, his personal experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kyle Spellman, he's involved uh, with two talks and he might mould them into one for us mm-hmm. for the event. Uh, one topic is food, uh, growing food, real health, uh, dangers of GM crops and mm-hmm. the other topic is social credits, um, alternative monetary solutions. Um, then we have Ashley Fitzgibbon who's working on fluoride exposure at the moment. Okay. Um, and she's had great news during the week. She's actually found a solicitor who will uh, take the case against the state on it, which is brilliant news. Mm-hmm. Great um, news, yeah. <coughs> ben Gilroy, he'll be talking about bank debt and the Constitution. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people would have heard of him recently. He's uh, been on YouTube videos that mm-hmm. are going around. Constitution the Hall Sheriff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's uh, he's helping. He's doing great work. They are helping out people. Absolutely. Brian Gerrish, <coughs> he's coming over from the UK. He's actively involved in the economic hitman talks with John Perkins. That's right. And uh, a conference. Twenty seventh of May. Yeah, yeah, that's the twenty seventh of May. It starts at Logan Park Hotel in Dublin. And he does work with Ian Crane as well in the UK. Mm-hmm. He's done some conferences over over there. So yeah. he's delighted to be coming over here. Yeah. And Paul Byrne, he'll be talking about coal fusion, free energy. And one sec, his tagline for it is Can we create a new economy based on clean, abundant energy? Mm-hmm. So that's who we have so far. There are one or two more speakers that we're hoping to get. How are you from We the People, being mm-hmm. one? And uh, Vinnie Byrne from TNS Radio. Yeah, and there's one or two more from the States, but we can't mm-hmm. mention yet because they're not confirmed. But okay. there'll be there'll be great topics there being discussed. Mm-hmm. Um so there's a good mix up there. Okay. Um So it sounds very, very interesting, I have to say, and I've been following uh, your your work, Clara, over the last couple of months and I know you put an awful lot of work into it. <coughs> and I wish you all the best with it, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, we we hope to get some advertising out there as well, don't we? On the, uh, uh, do I mention that as well? The advertising on on Edge Edge Media. Well, it's early days yet. Um, I've been speaking to some people involved in production mm-hmm. with Edge Media. Now they have to run it by um, other people involved uh, yeah. with the channel that's on. It's Channel Two Hundred on Sky for people who don't mm. know about it. It's very informative. Mm-hmm. Um, and it would be great if we could collaborate with them. Sure. Because it is being broadcast to Ireland after all. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, there is very little about Ireland mm-hmm. being spoken on Edge Media. So hopefully we can get them involved. Yeah. We just got the listeners to, to keep an eye out for that in the future that we might, we might have a couple of ads running on the Edge Media on Channel 200 on Sky. Mm-hmm. Also, um, at the end of each night on the event, we're going to have a Connecting the Dots and Seeking Solutions chat. And debate, so uh, that w- it's that's also another. It's very important. It's yeah, and it's an opportunity for people who are there attending mm-hmm. to get involved, and we're hoping to air that out over the internet as well. Sure. Now, the tickets for both days at the moment, the sales being discussed would be say twenty five euro mm-hmm. per day. Yeah. And if you book for the two days, it will be forty euro. Mm-hmm. Um, for ticket sales and inquiries, you could contact project.awaken at yahoo.com. Okay. And uh, we'll keep you posted as well on if there's any other speakers definitely going to be mm-hmm. made. They'll be put up on the advertising mm-hmm. as well. We'll have it, uh, the Awaken Waterford dot com website is still under construction we'll have that up and running soon and uh, Clara will be able to then post information up on that particular website directly about the event and anything else has changed or might change in the near future in relation to the event mm-hmm. yeah that's right and I'll be posting some information as well on my own show on Saturday 6 to 8 mm-hmm. so we might have um, what's the name of your show well it's there's no name on it but the I'm no name I'm show 
Yeah, it's just me, and I have different guests on every week on different topics. But I'm just any progress being made with the event, I'll be speaking about that at the end of each show. Okay. Well, that's great. Thanks very much, Clara, for coming on and coming into the studio here and uh, giving us an update about what's happening in your world. Okay. Thanks, James. Thank you. So that was Clara talking about. Um, the Awaken Waterford event coming up a two day event 16th and 17th of June called Project Awaken and there's posters up all over the internet uh, in relation to that now I've been asked to make a correction there and Harry Harry's website is wethepeople.ie sorry about that Harry uh, even though I hear you on TNS radio all the time with Vinia I sometimes forget that you have your own website going on there too also Scottish Sovereign would like to say um, a big hello uh, to everyone listening in uh, in Scotland so guys Thanks very much for listening in, and I hope you're enjoying uh, the shows so far. We're going to go straight into the next segment, and this is Tracy's update, which was recorded earlier on today. And on the mobile phone, we have Tracy O'Connor, who's going to give us this week's update on what's happening around the country within the Awakened Ireland movement. Tracy, welcome back to the show. Thanks, James. It's a pleasure. Okay, Tracy, what's happening? Um, since we spoke last, yep. Since we spoke last, a couple of us got together um, in Cork, who had been at the original Bog Hill meeting. We had been communicating by email and telephone and so on, but we hadn't actually met since Bog Hill. It was a really useful um, meeting, uh, very productive and very positive. Um, Claire Knowles from Cork was good enough to host the meeting in our house. Um, thank you, so thank you, Claire. Um, thank you, Claire. Uh, yeah, a, a couple of things came out of the meeting the main things being uh, that there was an agreement to really streamline the communications of where we were going. I mean, all this started off as individuals coming together. So um, what's happening now is it's really becoming um, a more obvious movement in itself. Awaken Ireland was a, a agreed as the name because there was a couple of different names that hadn't been agreed before uh, that had been thrown out there. And it was agreed that Awaken Ireland is definitely the way forward in mm-hmm. terms of being a sort of an umbrella uh, for all of the different initiatives that are going on. Yeah. Um, so this, the communications are going to be streamlined between the emails. There's the Awaken Ireland at gmail.com. Facebook page is Awaken Ireland. You've probably seen yourself with the different email lists uh, that was called Ireland's Future is now called Awaken Ireland. So it's just um, taking on more of a solid uh, energy. Great. Um, Another thing that came out of that meeting was that um, uh, Donnick O'Loughlin, who was there from Cork, he's a he's a plumber by trade. He was mm-hmm. originally at the Bog Hill, as you remember. I do. Um, Lovely fellow, and Donnick. Donnick has, uh, he's a great guy. Mm-hmm. Um, he is very passionate, as we all are, about making change happen and creating conversations in the community. So he's hosting Awaken Clonic Guilty mm-hmm. on the 25th of May. 25th of May. Okay, very good. 25th of May, so in two weeks' time. And one of the things that done it, what, what came out of uh, the, the meeting that we had in Cork was that, well, what's everybody's role in Awaken Ireland and what are we all going to do? Um, and what emerged was, well, in fact, it's really simple. We all just focus on what our talents are and what, what our passion is about. Yeah. Um, one of the things that Donna, as a plumber, is going to be focusing on as a positive solution is rainwater harvesting. Okay. And he has initiated conversation with the company in Cork to actually uh, provide that solution. Brilliant. Um, so he's he's really going down that road. So he'll be providing. We'll, we'll get him on the show to talk about that as well. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Now, um, Richard Moore, who was part of the Bog Hill uh, group as well and very involved in getting this whole thing together, will be is working with Donna to mm-hmm. get Awakened Clan of Kilty off the ground. So it'll be like a roadshow event that we've done already. In that, there'll be positive solutions, a few talks, and providing a platform for conversations in the local community. Um, so that's on the 25th of May. Great. And we'll keep you updated on that. Okay. What's um, next? And I know Richard will probably come on to update you afterwards as well about what happens. Yeah, we'll get him on the show. We, we haven't booked in for the 27th. That'll be a pre recorded show because we'll be up in Dublin at the... Uh, John Perkins, uh, Max Kaiser events. That's right, uh, mm-hmm. which is happening in the Still Organ Park Hotel, just to yeah. remind everybody. It's the 27th of May, uh, the Sunday, and as you announced last week, Max Kaiser and Stacey will be coming over to Dublin um, as part of um, the the actual John Perkins event as part of the Financial Terrorism Exposed 
mm-hmm. um, where, which is happening in London, Manchester, and in Dublin. Yeah. And Max Kaiser and Stacey are only coming to Dublin. They're not going to the other two events. They're they coming really over especially to spend time with the Irish people, and we do really appreciate yeah. that. They're flying over from America, and they're flying back again afterwards. I mean... Uh, what more could you ask for? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So powerful. Uh, and they really see the potential here and and the opportunity uh, that we have to create the change. And if people are, like, the since we announced it and since it was announced last week that Max and Stacey are coming to Dublin, the tickets are pretty much taken off. Uh, so that if doesn't surprise me at all, Tracy. Space, say that again, James, sorry? That, that doesn't surprise me at all, you know, because... No, um, no, exactly. He's quite well known. Yeah, they're, they're they're powerful speakers. Um, yeah. So if anybody's interested in getting a ticket, just go on to onewoscam dot com. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of the websites basically that will get you through yeah. uh, to get a ticket. But right. it's uh, highly advisable to get the tickets as soon as possible. Okay, what's next, sir? Um, so yeah, uh, Richard Moore, as I was mentioning uh, last week as well, is starting the Positive Initiatives Group. Has started the Positive Initiatives. And again, as I mentioned last week, very much like a roto, uh, based more on economic solutions. And Richard and Trina, Ryan uh, is working to see with Richard to yep. host a citizens forum mm-hmm. as part of this as part as part of the positive initiatives. And it's in July, and it's going to be in Clonic Guilty. So again, Richard can update you next week or right. whenever you have him on about that. But just yes. another initiative that's coming together is right. be kind of like a bog hill. Uh, whole day events. So, um, so that's I'm really looking forward to really looking forward to that. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the other updates is, of course, uh, from the fluoride campaign, and I spoke to Ashling last week, um, and she had great updates in terms of solicitors coming on board and everything. But one of the major other updates on that since then is that the Mercy Mount Talk uh, School uh, transition year students that Martha uh, is teaching um, and help them put together the project would you pay for poison mm-hmm. uh, based around the fluoride getting the fluoride out of the water they were up in Dublin during the week and they received first prize they were awarded the People's Choice Award for the Eco UNESCO Young Environmentalist Awards that's fantastic so basically people voted for all the different projects that all the different schools around Ireland came up with and the people voted over 30% of the people voted for this project as opposed to I think the second was 18% so the massive Massive um, results mm-hmm. for for Martha and mm-hmm. Mercy Nine Talk and truly fantastic. And not only that, the next day they um, be, they came second in Ireland in the Youth Social Innovators Competition for what they did as well for the Would You Pay for Poison project. Brilliant. So it's real recognition that they're on the right track and they're getting the information out there and raising awareness and what better way than to win an award, two awards in fact in two days, so well done to them Fantastic, that's great um, Then, uh, just as I was mentioning last week yeah, um, Alan Boylan in Dublin uh, was doing a public survey which I mentioned last week Alan actually uh, went ahead and completed his survey Brilliant. Alan is really passionate about making change, as we all are and he did up a questionnaire, um, which he went basically onto the dart, and he asked people on the dart. I was kind of curious as to what kind of areas he was asking people the questions in, and it wasn't just located in one spot. He went to Hope, he went to Bray, he basically did a lot of questioning on the dart, he went to the Pavilion Shopping Centre in Thorpe, so where there's a high concentration of people, um, but a, a broad spectrum of people. Fantastic. And the results were actually very interesting. He okay. did on his own in one day, basically. He interviewed 242 people. Wow. <laughs> no mean feat. Um, and he basically then took all the information and collated it and, uh, you know, with yes or no answers to keep it simple. And, uh, you know, bearing in mind that Alan's never done this before either. Mm. Um, so he took it upon himself and went out there. And it's great to see um, basically 70% of the people think that the ordinary Irish citizen has not got a voice in, in Europe. So mm-hmm. 70% don't think that the ordinary Irish, Irish citizen has a voice in Europe. Wow. It's along the same lines as we're all thinking. And exactly. he just confirmed it by yeah. asking these questions. 242 well, We people. have him on the show Another there tonight, so we'll, we'll be talking to him about that. We'll go into more detail with him about that. Great, so he can go into it in more detail. Exactly. But just to give people a, a snippet of what the results are, um, mm-hmm. 95% of people said that they would like to see a broad range of solutions up for public debate. 
Okay. Rather than just a solution imposed on them. So 95% of people are open to, you know, they want to see a, a, a broad mix of solutions mm-hmm. and and up for debate, which is a kind of not like rocket science, but it's, it's, it's logical, but it's confirmation that this is in fact what everybody's thinking. Brilliant. Well, we're and on it's the right not track, what so. you're being told. No, it's not what you're being told. Uh, but that's why it needs to be a grassroots movement. Yeah, exactly. Um, another interesting one is that 74% of people didn't know anything about Iceland's solution to their crisis. And like that's pretty major as well. And that's probably yeah. down to the fact that, again, it's not media, being media told blackout. in the public media, yeah. in the traditional media form, you know. Mm-hmm. It's great. Uh, having having those questions and having the, the information that Alan's providing allows us to move it forward and, and focus on what needs to change and what we need to work on. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's great. He'll, he'll be coming on to tell you all about that as well. Brilliant. Well, we're looking forward to that as well. Uh, is, is that it, Tracy? Have yeah. anything else before we finish up? Uh, just, uh, yeah, just one, one last thing. Um, Steve Kerr, who's uh, Awakened Mayo in Castle Bar, has mm-hmm. been working closely with Ben Gilroy. Um, uh, I, I know you've been on the show as well. Uh, but I just thought it was interesting to mention that Ben and Raymond Whitehead and Claire Leonard are all available for talks anywhere in the country if anybody wants to organise a talk on... Uh, what their rights are as a homeowner, as a business owner, okay. uh, direct democracy, and the relationship between gold, oil, and the fiat currency. So very interesting and uh, normal uh, conversation and information on on where we are in terms of people, where they're getting stuck and everything. So Ben, Steve is uh, helping Ben and Ray and Claire to organise these talks in the country. So if any interested in them coming to their town to give a talk, um, to get more information out, just email. I suppose the easiest thing is to do is to email awakenireland at gmail dot com, and we we'll pass the information on. Brilliant. Okay. Well, that's great. Yeah. Thanks very much, Tracy, and uh, we, we'll no catch problem. up with you again next week. Yeah, sure. Okay. No problem we'll at all. So, if anybody again, if anybody has any updates or information or anything like that, just email us uh, awakenireland at gmail dot com. At gmail dot com. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thanks, okay. Tracy. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Dave. Talk to you Bye. And that was uh, Tracy O'Connor giving uh, giving us another update there on what's happening uh, countrywide in relation to the Awaken Ireland uh, movement, and she's working very hard behind the scenes all the time to let everybody know uh, exactly what's happening in each county. And uh, fair play to Tracy for all the hard work that she's doing. So, Paul, we're going to go into another song here. Now we've got a. Beanfield with a fantastic song called Home. So, hello folks, back with you again. Now, I'm just going to read out a a post here from Sonia Oldham. Actually, it's called Objection to the Stability Treaty, and you can find it in Newsbeak in Ireland, and it was posted on the 12th of May. So, basically, uh, the proper informal term for the treaty is the Fiscal Compact Treaty. Referring it as the Stability Treaty is misleading, yet the term is included in the full name However, so is coordination and governance. This infers the treaty will bring stability. That point is well disputed and many leading economists would disagree. If an informal name is to be given, it should be the fiscal compact. The front page of the leaflet only refers to the term stability treaty when it should have been given its full title. The wording on the first page is biased towards a yes vote. Disputable claims are not facts and should be not and should be included in an unbiased information leaflet. The introduction seems to presume that it was our deficit that caused the crisis and not the financial sector. We know this is untrue. So, the first claim. It's a treaty aiming to support growth and employment, especially for Euro-area countries, including Ireland. So, counterclaim. Where are the provisions or articles within the treaty that specify terms to foster growth and employment? There are no terms within this treaty that specifically deal with these issues. Merely mentioning them without any substance does not constitute fact. Claim 2. The Stability Treaty is an international agreement among 20-ish European countries, including all countries who, like Ireland, use the euro. The treaty states that its purpose is to support sustainable growth, employment, competitiveness, and social cohesion. Counterclaim. The treaty may state this, but there is no evidence to support that the treaty will in fact make those aims. 
Leading economists would dispute the assertion that the treaty will support growth or employment. The German Institute for Macroeconomical and Economical Research estimates that the effect of this will to be drive down the Eurozone growth to a mere half percent average annual growth up to 2016, depending on the timing of the fiscal consolidation. Depressing economic growth during a period of stagnation will undermine confidence in an economy's ability to generate the future revenue needed to repay its debts. The government the government's recovery strategy is based on an expanding export base. However, if European countries are simultaneously driving down their demand, our markets for export will be con- contracting. Social cohesion is the capacity of a society to ensure the well-being of all its members, minimizing disparities and avoiding marginalization. This is a treaty that by its very nature and original purpose will be enacted to save the euro not and not looking to the well-being of any nation member. Claim 3. The treaty requires every country to have its own law to protect the public's money in terms of how much is borrowed and raised in taxes and spent. Counterclaim. Where in the treaty does it specify this law to protect the public's money? If this were true, rather than placing an automatic debt break in our law, we would instead have a treaty on regulation and supervision in the financial sector. This would do more to protect the public's money from the moral hazards of the banks and bondholders. What is undisputed is that it was the financial sector that caused this crisis, not our deficit. Claim 4. To do this, it requires countries to apply discipline to their national budgets through stronger rules to help get debts under control and through a rule which balanced out in good times and bad and bad uh, taken together ensures that the government doesn't spend more than it can raise in taxes over time. Counterclaim. Again, the deficit was not caused by overspending. If the fiscal compact had been in place, it would have not prevented the crisis. In 2007, Ireland's debt-to-GDP ratio was 24.8%, far less than the 60% dictated by the fiscal treaty. Our general budget was in surplus of 0.1%, compared to a target of of a deficit of 3%, and our structural balance was estimated by the EU Commission in spring 2008 to be in a surplus of 0.2%, compared to a target of a maximum deficit of 0.5%. Later on, the structure balanced was revised downwards, with the Commission in 2011 saying that Ireland had a structural deficit of 1.4%. So having the structures of the fiscal treaty in place would not have meant that we could have avoided the economic crisis. In fact, the government would have been congratulated on having met the targets effectively and with such a high growth rate. ensures that your government doesn't spend more than it can raise in taxes. This implies that it was that overspending had caused the crisis. As we can see from the figures above, this was not the case. However, bailing out the banks and bondholders did adversely affect our deficit. How much is the bailout costing? Bond payments in September 2008 to April 2012 were 103.7 billion euro. Bond payments from April. 2012 onwards are 40.6 billion. So far, according to Mr. Noonan, the bank recapitalization is 62.8 billion. That's just for the Anglo INBS, 34.7 billion for AIB EBS, 20.7 billion for Bank of Ireland. I could go on and on. Given that, according to Mr. Noonan, these banks have still over 40 billion to pay and there is a good possibility that we may have to recapitalize again. Also, this figure does not include interest lost on the money taken from the National Pension Reserve Fund, nor does it include the interest we will have to pay on the borrowing needed to fund all the recapitalization. Claim 5. The treaty is part of a toolkit to help avoid another economic crisis. Counterclaim. If this were true, where is the rest of the kit? The crisis was caused by the financial sector. How does this treaty prevent such a reoccurrence? According to Konstantin Gorgiev, economist, 
There is nothing within the pact that would facilitate either Portuguese or Irish economic stability and recovery. When it comes to dealing with the current crisis, the new pact contains no tools for achieving structural reforms required to, adv- required to arrive at sustainable public finances. No country has been successful in restoring fiscal and external balances after a de- decade of twin deficits. According to Paul de Grau for this, from the Centre for European Policy Studies in Brussels, he said, with the establishment of the ESM shield, the Euro- excuse me, with the establishment of the ESM shield, the Eurozone from future, cri- from future crises. My answer is unambiguous. Hmm. It will not. In fact, it is worse than that. Some of the features that we have been introduced in the functioning of the ESM will make it more difficult for a number of countries, in particular Ireland, to attract funds in private markets. These features will have an effect of increasing rather than reduction, reducing vi- volatility in the financial markets. It is part of a sorry claim six. It is part of a group of plans and rules aimed at helping the economic recovery and to prevent a repeat of the economic and financial crisis that we've had in Europe and Ireland in recent years. Counterclaim: Helping economic recovery, prevent a repeat. Again, the leading economists say that this would not have prevented the crisis and will not prevent reoccurrence, but will indeed lead to a worsening of the recession. To prevent a reoccurrence, the financial sector needs to be overhauled, regulated and supervised. Another option would be for the ECB to lend directly to the banks and not to the governments. Helping economic recovery, according to the economist, the pact's rigidity would make recessions worse and the new fiscal rule would not have kept Ireland or Spain out of trouble. According to the Davy report, the fiscal compact would have had no bearing on the collapse in Ireland's public finances had it been adopted at the inception of the euro. The cause of the crisis that we should be working on so as to avoid a repeat of the economic and financial crisis. According to the banking inquiry, financial integration in the euro area allowed banks in Ireland unprecedented access to cross-border funding. As in many smaller EU economies, the entry of foreign banks intensified competition in lending. The bank's ability to borrow cheaply in international wholesale markets created a capital flow bonanza, which has been observed to markedly increase the likelihood of a banking crisis within the receiving country. This has clearly happened in Ireland. According to the Assistant Director General of the Financial Institution Supervision Central Bank of Ireland, in the 2000s it is clear that the low ECB policy rate facilitated the growth of property prices in Ireland. There was also no direct regulation of credit limits, for example through restrictions on LTV ratios. This meant that the Irish households were able to accumulate liabilities more easily than consumers in countries where there were stricter regulations. A contributing cause of the crisis was that the banks, the bank governance and risk management were weak, in some cases disastrously so. According to the bank inquiry, these supervisory problems must be seen in conjunction with the absence of forceful warnings from the central bank. However, the IMF's major financial system stability assessment of 2006 did not sound the alarm. According to the Assistant Director General of the Financial Institutions, Supervision of the Central Bank, a striking lesson of the global banking crisis is the danger of allowing banks to operate to free market principles within free market economies. Clemens Fust, the German economist, said, without a fundamental reform of the European banking sector, the euro is in jeopardy, as is the financial industry, he argues, that repeatedly endangers the monetary Union. Ireland's budgetary problems are the result, not the cause of the crisis. So, claim seven. This treaty does not change how decisions on taxing and spending are made. Claim eight. The rule, the rules in the treaty, many of which are already in place under other European laws, do not affect the role of governments and national parliaments in decision making on tax and spending. Counterclaim. According to Article 5 of the Treaty, 1. A contracting party that is subject to an ex- excessive deficit procedure under the treaties on which the European Union is founded 
shall put in place a budgetary and economic partnership program, including a detailed description of the structural reforms which must be put in place and implemented to ensure an effective and durable correction of its excessive deficit. The content and format of such programs shall be defined in European law. Their submission to the Council of of the European Union and to the European Commission for endorsement and their monitoring will take place within the context of the existing surveillance procedures under Stability and Growth Pact. Article 3. In the event of significant observed deviations from the medium-term objective or from the adjustment path towards it, a correction mechanism shall be triggered automatically. The mechanism shall include the obligation of the contracting party concerned to implement measures to correct the deviations over a defined period of time. Decisions on taxing and spending will be influenced if not implemented from the EU and shows a significant divergence from past procedure. So, claim the Stability Treaty is a significant element of the joint efforts being made in Ireland and the EU to tackle the economic crisis and to restore international investor confidence. This is particularly important for a small open economy like Ireland, which depends very heavily on inward investment by multinationals and on exports to create jobs. Counterclaim. This is a matter of opinion and not fact. Please refer to the many economists who say they will do nothing this will do nothing to solve the crisis and that it is unlikely to restore investor confidence. In fact, they say because Ireland depends so heavily on the EU for exports that the impact will be to, to depress growth and external demand. The treaty is particularly relevant to Ireland's economy and to investor confidence in the following ways. Claim 1. Renewed confidence in a stable euro. The treaty refers to the importance of safeguarding and stabilising the euro area. Its rules are intended to contribute contribute to stronger economic growth and investment in the European Union. Counterclaim. Again, this is a matter of opinion and not fact. In fact, they say because Ireland depends so heavily on the EU for exports that the impact will be to depress growth and external demand. Claim 2. Access to EU assistance funds. The treaty will allow Ireland to access the EU's new assistance fund, the European Stability Mechanism, ESM, should it be ever needed. It is important that Ireland be eligible to receive this funding in the event of any future economic problems and to reassure those who wish to invest in Ireland. It is necessary to ratify the treaty to continue to be able to access the ESM fund. Counterclaim. This claim is also disputed. The European Stability Mechanism, ESM, the ESM treaty refers to new financing. This reference to new means that the current programme can be extended and financed under the ESM itself, because it would not be regarded as new. It is merely a continuation of support, support that the EU leaders have already guaranteed. We welcome the latest positive reviews of the Irish and Portuguese programmes, which concluded the qualitative performance criteria and structural benchmarks have been met. We will continue to provide support to countries under our programme until they have regained market access, provided they they successfully implement implement their programmes. This was issued after the Fiscal Treaty and the ESM Clause was approved at EU level. It is not being contradicted in any subsequent EU statements. In short, the Irish Government is the only government in the EU to claim that Ireland will be isolated. Also, there are other alternatives and to in, insinuate otherwise would be misleading. The European Financial Stability Facility, the E. FSF is accepting applications for new money up to the middle of 2013 and will stay open to administer this money in subsequent years so that new extended or rolled over financing can come from the ESFF up to July 2013. This further underscores the EU leaders' guarantee to Ireland. The argument that the current programmes run out after the deadline for ESSF funding doesn't stand up. The IMF, Bill Murray, Director of the External Relations of the IMF, has said there is no reason why Ireland could not ask for another loan when the current bailout programme ends in 2013. Any IMF member country can make an application to us for a loan. Asked if there was anything to stop Ireland from doing so, he said no. The only countries from which we would not accept an application are non-members 
or those that are not in good standing of the previous IMF loans. Murray said it did not matter to the agency whether the country had access to the ESM mechanism or not. Claim. Good housekeeping. For the moment, we still spend a lot more than we raise in taxes. This cannot last, because debt will grow further and your taxes will go more and more to paying for the debt rather than for public services and job incentives. We have to manage our debts and budgets. This is at the heart of this treaty, and these budgeting rules will apply to all countries which ratify the treaty. Counterclaim. Good housekeeping insinuates that we are overspending, when in fact we are underspending on essential services. The word insinuates our problems are down to bad housekeeping. This is untrue. The deficit is caused by bailing out the banks and bondholders. This treaty finds countries already in trouble. Only four countries are within, within the deficit. The only country that is in crisis because of housekeeping is actually Greece. To infer that the crisis is down to bad housekeeping is incredibly misleading. To infer that this treaty in any way deals with any of the causes of the crisis is not factual. That was from Sonia Oldham. And that's up in um, News Beacon, Ireland. It's a great website. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, everyone should have a look at that at some stages. It, that's actually one of the guys from uh, the Bog Hill Centre, Rudy. Uh, Rudy, that's his, his site, and he's a, a contributor to that site, that blog, uh, uh, as well as many others as well. Paul, in simple layman's language, you know, what's your take on that, you know? Um the words that come into my head, I won't even say them on the radio, James. They're, uh, they're swear words. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous, if you ask me. That's the only word I have for at the moment, yeah. this fiscal treaty. Uh, well, I think the, most of the country is pretty wise to it now at this stage. Yeah. You know, anyone I've talked to in the pub or on the street or anywhere, family, you know, people in the troop movement, they, they all know the story. Yeah, know, it's, it's a hole that can't be plugged, you know. Yeah. The, we have the Dublin debt clock here. And it's at one hundred and thirty billion ninety eight million four hundred and thirty three four hundred and forty four four hundred and forty five thousand euro. It's going up a thousand euro every second and a half or so. Yeah. Yeah. And um oh in two thousand and nine it was sixty five point two billion and now we're up to one hundred and thirty point nine eight billion euro. So we can safely say austerity does not work. It does not work. No chance. And it cannot chance. work. It will never work. It's enslavement. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks for that, Paul. We're going to go into the next segment now. And the next segment is uh, Ben Gilroy. And I was talking to Ben uh, at 12 o'clock right on today. And he's giving us a fill in exactly what's happening in his world. On the phone we have uh, Ben Gilroy. Ben, welcome back to the show. How are you? I'm not too bad. Ben, you had some uh, interesting uh, fun there with a the receiver recently. Can you tell us about that? Sure, yeah. Um, the receiver came down to uh, repossess a business in Navin. Yeah. And, um, you know, the chap, I know, I know the chap, he, he tried to do deals with the bank and that, but they were just, you know, a lot of these banks just don't want to sit down and talk or postpone payments or stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Now, I know some do, but there's still a lot that doesn't, you know? And, um, Remember, these banks all got bailed out, so I'm all for doing deals with them if they want to do it, and if they don't, well, so we'll have to fight them then, you know. So That's it. the receiver arrives with a court order. Right. And um, as he starts to open up a door, we'll have a video of it soon. It's, it's actually quite funny. Right. Um, because uh, they're opening one of the roller shutter doors, and one of the security guys is opening it for the receiver. Yeah. And as he opens the front door, my friend Johnny steps inside the door, shuts real quick, locks it, just waves out at them. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole thing then turns out to be hilarious. I question him and he engages me and the thing is like a, a scene from The Life of Brian or something. You know, it's really funny. <laughs> so I'm nice. hoping that'll be up in the next uh, couple of days. So, yeah, but the thing about the court yeah. order is it wasn't signed. Right. And he told us it was signed by the registrar. Okay. Um, now, we didn't notice at the time, but when we watched the film back of it, it was actually being pointed out to me that um, when we looked at it, he was able to freeze frame the, the video as we're videoing the court order. Mm -hmm. And um, we noticed it's not even signed by the, the registrar. Wow. It's signed by somebody else who attests it. It's stamped, you know, by a signature, and then I attest this for the registrar. The registrar's name is only typed on it. Yeah. He doesn't sign it, and neither did the judge sign it. So would that not be fraud then, Ben? 
sorry? Would that not be fraud? He's engaging in fraud. He's... Well, that's what we're looking at now because he's telling us it was signed by the registrar. Now, the registrar in these circumstances, my understanding of this is that they're only civil servants in the High Court. Yeah. They're not like registrars around the country where the registrar would also be the sheriff and would be a solicitor for at least five years. Mm. So, as far as I know, the registrars in the High Court are only civil servants. Right. Um, but anyway, it's the judge who makes the order, so the judge should sign it. I mean, it should be signed, sealed, and delivered, right? So yeah. that's what we're saying. Now, we did hear from someone inside the courts uh, that they went back to court uh, the Tuesday. This happened on the Friday before the bank holiday, and they went um, uh, back to the court on the Tuesday, which was after the bank holiday Monday, looking for the judge to sign the order. And... Um, uh, they were refused. Uh, I think the judge refused to sign it. Right. So, um, so I think, like, this is what we've heard from the inside, that the judge said she, she wanted it left in her chambers. So they went back on the Wednesday, and she basically told them the same thing. So we got a letter from the solicitors uh, drawing our attention to some rules of the Superior Court, mm -hmm. which uh, says the order doesn't have to be signed by the judge. But obviously, us being lay litigants, the rules of the Superior Court really have nothing to do with us. I mean, I'm not part of that tennis club, right? So yeah. I don't have to serve the ball the right way. Exactly, yeah. So we're just sticking our ground, standing our ground. We also feel that if we were in the wrong, we probably would have been arrested by now for, um, uh, what do they call it, contempt? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's where we stand at the minute. Anyway, we'll see what happens next. Very good, very good. And uh, anything else happening in relation to the direct democracy? Uh, yeah, we actually have, uh, I don't know if you remember what they used to call the grey vote a few years ago when all the pensioners marched and they no. set up a, a political party. And they've actually decided to give us their party. Mm -hmm. So it saves all the red tape and bullshit for months of uh, setting parties up. Yeah, so yeah. they're yeah, actually giving us the party and we can just change the name and the constitution of it mm -hmm. to direct democracy. Right. So that will fast track it a good bit. Um, so hopefully over the next few weeks uh, we should have a, a good bit on. Right. And, um, you know, once we launch it, you see, you'll get plenty of PR, even on RTE, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that'd be great. I mean, surely we, there's something we can do down here in Waterford as well in relation to that. We'll have a look into that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, direct democracy, as I say, is just something we had in our first constitution. But uh, you know, I know people argue about which is the first constitution. But if they believe it's twenty-two, sure, let them have it. Yeah. And it was in that. But the only thing I know is they took it out while nobody seemed to be watching. So we're just for putting it back because, um, it, you know, it makes governments behave, you know, yeah. and it makes them do their jobs for, you know, they're supposed to be doing it for us, the people, rather than for themselves. Yeah. Um, someone very, handed me a book here the other it? day, and it's called, and I'll just see, I actually have it here. I suggest everybody gets it, it's a good read. Uh, Political Corruption in Ireland, 1922 to 2010. It's called uh, A Crooked Harp. <laughs> right. And, you know, as I was re reading through that, you want to see the amount of tribunals that I forgot about and the money that they cost. Yeah, I know. And it's kind of hopefully to stop that nonsense, like, you know. Yeah. That they're, they're only jobs for boys, you know. That's all that is. All those yeah, it is. But, but not only that, um, it stops silly decisions being made as well because if people have the power of referendum, which they should have had, uh, then when you have silly decisions like bailing out bondholders or bringing in tax against homes or whatever it might be, that you don't have to go out marching and stuff like that. Wasting their time, you know, yeah. they, they know they shouldn't do that because they're working for the people, not yeah. taxing for corporations of Europe. Yeah. So when they decide to do that, I mean, if you're sitting around the cabinet and you're in with the boys and you come up with the idea of taxing the home, I'll say to you, well, that's a terrific idea. Mm -hmm. But you know they have direct democracy and they're just going to vote that down. And with, with the direct, direct democracy, <laughs> so Ben, makes you behave. Uh, with the direct democracy, Ben, how many, many votes do you have to have before you can force a referendum? Um, well, you see, we'll have to actually get that put back into the Constitution first. Yeah. So the only way we can do that is through election, you know, whether that's either local elections or, or the national elections. Okay. Um, once you get it back into the Constitution, you can then even force a new election, if you wish, if you find that the whole government are absolutely nonsense, because it's what's called recall. 
Yeah. Or you can get rid of individual TDs as well if they're not performing on the job or promising stuff that yeah. they shouldn't have promised. Okay. You know? No, I don't mean that r right across the board. I mean, somebody might, you know, promise to put a zebra crossing outside the school yeah. and then yeah. couldn't do it. But I'm talking major stuff, like, look at they yeah. know they can't uh, do them. Just like like the, cor the, current the, they, the current government then promised that they wouldn't bail out Sorry? anymore. The current government promised that they wouldn't bail, you know, pay any more bondholders. Um, yeah, I mean, is. that sort of thing. I mean, that's like that's probably the biggest uh, tax uh, inflicted on the people since the foundation of this state. Yeah. And it, it affects seemingly the least well-off in society as well, as all middle class as well. Yeah. And um, so because of that, it's probably the most taxing thing ever on the state. And when they were thrown out the old Fianna Fáil government and to come in promising they wouldn't do it, and then to just turn around and do it, is a complete disaster, like, you know? Absolutely. Well, it, it just so, uh, like, I, I haven't voted, as I told you before, since my early 20s. Yeah, I'm saying. And you just, you get so sick of it, people knocking at your door and saying, oh, we'll do this and we'll do that. I prefer if somebody uh, told the truth and just said things like, um, look, you know, we're going to screw you over, but I won't screw you as much as the next guy coming in. Yeah, yeah. I might respect that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know where you're coming from. Yeah, absolutely. But the whole system needs to be overhauled. I mean, the whole, the whole, um, uh, the whole thing. Yeah, you're yeah, right. The whole from top cross, to bottom. Cross, I mean, even this idea of party system, all people writing part. speeches for you and everything, and you're reading from a sheet. Yeah. I mean, what happened to a guy just being able to stand up and say what he, what he believes and just leave it at that? And okay, but it's not word perfect, and he makes the odd mistake in a word. So what? At least it's coming from him. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, who are these speech writers that are writing these for these guys as well? Yeah. All that PR stuff and, um, like, dri drives me insane, you know? Yeah. But the problem as well we have is that most of the legislation comes from Europe and as well. I mean, look look at this, these new treaties that they're looking to for is true. I mean, that's just unbelievable, like... It is, yeah. And you can slowly see the um, our sovereignty being eroded away, as well as our, our Irishness, if you know what I mean. Like, we're, we're a unique island here, and yeah. the more you travel, the more you realise it's a great little country. But you can see them just inflicting their stuff, and stuff they don't understand, like, say they like to cut and turf even, you know, yeah. uh, to ban that. I mean, f you know, where is the sense in that? Yeah. And then, like, obviously giving away all our rights as well, our fishing rights and oil rights and gas rights and yeah. everything. The whole thing is a nonsense. And how we don't have decent people in government anymore to stand up and say, look, enough's enough is beyond me. I, I think when they actually get up to the door, maybe power hits their head or the wages are... I don't it's even think it's much that... much easier not I, to rock the boat. Like, I don't you know? even think it's that, Ben. I think what it is is because that the, the parties are their corporations themselves. Yeah. And they answer to bigger corporations and the, the banks yeah. control the country. And that's really what it is. I mean, I reckon you get into power and then you're brought into a room and you're, you're shown uh, the figures for this and that. And then you're, you meet the bosses and you kind of go, well, these are the guys actually run the country and you're just for the public. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, direct democracy works extremely well, uh, as I said, in Switzerland. But... Um, you can see, actually, uh, there was a document there somebody sent me the other day where the EU were trying to put pressure on them to uh, fully take part in the EU and give up this direct democracy now. <laughs> Seriously, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to forward it on and, and put it on. Maybe you can show it on the screen next week or something like that. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll def definitely read it out. You know, I'd, I'd like yeah. to get more involved with reading out stuff like that, you know, in the show, to be honest with you, rather than not just doing interviews, but... Engaging in the, what what you're talking about, what other other guests are talking about as well, you know. Of course, yeah. Come here. What's going on then with the uh, the the, the um, your, your block on the payout of the bonds, the bondholders? Um, um, we're still working on that statement, the claim. Um, Can you go back to the start of that again? Because I didn't ask about that last week, and I, the last week, and I should have really. How yeah. did that come about, and where is it now? Um, okay. Basically, what we did is uh, we thought they were going to pay out the bondholders at the end of last month. And um, it turns out, uh, I believe, that they actually have the money to do it. All right. Uh, so they tried all these plans about kicking down the road for another, to 2025, I think, 13 years from now. Right. So what they're basically saying is, look, we're the ones who screwed up. Let's pass this debt on to our children. And when I say we screwed up, I don't mean us, the Irish people. Mm -hmm. I mean gamblers on the stock exchange. Yeah. And, and now because Ireland has no more money to pay them back uh, for their gambling debts, they decided now to kick it down the road for a while and okay. see. What they really want to do, I think, is when it's not highlighted so much in the press, because there was a bit of uproar about it. Mm -hmm. And when that dies down then, I think they're going to send that on.
right. uh, and try to get it in. So we brought a case against the government and uh, we went up and served the papers um, against Noonan, the Minister for Finance, and uh, Enda Kenny, John Taoiseach. And basically it's to prevent any of our sovereign money being uh, handed over to gamblers on the stock exchange. Now, we worded it slightly nicer than that, but that's the crux of the matter. Yeah. And we said we didn't want it paid back in promissory notes, government bonds, any sort of financial instrument, now or in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, the main part of our case is that it was an odious debt. So if people Google odious debt, they'll see a debt which is taken on by a regime, which would yeah. be Fianna Fáil, mm-hmm. <laughs> a corrupt regime at that, mm-hmm. because we had the Matin Tribunal, which cost 500 million to tell us something we already knew. 500 million? Yeah, that's what the Matin Tribunal cost, oh. yeah. To find out Bertie got 60,000 in the back pocket. <laughs> There's more to it than that, of course, you know. But anyway, yeah. that's what it cost us, yeah, 500 million. And um, so w- when a debt is taken on by a, a, a regime that didn't benefit the people, yeah. right, it's called an odious debt under UN law okay. and does not have to be paid back. Mm-hmm. But then we find out that Michael Noonan has bonds in Germany and stands to make 1.2 million on this payout. I'm not saying that's why it was done now. It seems a small price to pay for selling your country out, so I'd imagine he didn't do it because of that. Michael it just Noonan. happened to be a side benefit. Um, so it's an odious debt. It's also unconstitutional um, because the banks were all involved in illegal behaviour you know, they had these uh, laws, um, which were called liquidity laws, and basically about keeping the banks liquid, and you can see none of them done it. Yeah. And there was five years in prison for this. Yeah. And then by bailing these guys out, our government is now supporting the criminals and their criminal activity. Right. That uh, would be repugnant to our constitution. Well, for our complicit. government is supporting any criminal activity. Yeah, uh, especially to the detriment of the people. So you can mm-hmm. see who these, who our governments uh, which are corporations who they're really working for. They work for the large corporations of Europe and the world. Yeah. And we really have to stop this. And we're in a great position here in Ireland because with only 4 million people, like, we're only really the size of Manchester. So yeah. I wouldn't like to be doing it in the States, as I said before. No, so no. It's a, good, it's a good time in history to do it too, you know? Stand up and take power back and show the rest of the world, look, you can do it if you really want. People have the power. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I think through the Awaken Ireland movement as well, Ben, that you'd be able to uh, spread uh, this, this information that you're gathering around. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Country, the know. Awaken movement uh, really are people who are awake. I mean, uh, it's a great name. I, I talk to a lot of people in the Awaken movement, and, you know, they are so awake and tuned in to what's going on, because sometimes I'm talking to ordinary people who, uh, and, and I don't mean Awaken people are ordinary, but you know what I mean, just the nine to five people that I'm talking about. They're so engrossed in their life and who's winning X Factor or yeah. a talent or whatever it might be, you know. Yeah. They really have no idea of what's going on outside their window. No. And that's, that's worrying. It is, it is. <laughs> but you see, the problem is there's so much information coming at you from radio, from TV, from billboards, you know, from the, even from the internet, if you're looking at the wrong, in the wrong places, that it's, it's very hard to actually stop it. Uh, it is very hard to cipher out, and you know, as I keep saying, you need to have your bullshit filter on, and a lot <laughs> of people just don't have it. That's exactly so hopefully it, if we get part of that media stream, that we can spell it out much easier. We actually have our uh, little uh, leaflet or brochure on direct democracy done up now, yeah. and it'll be, I think from next week on, it'll be available for download from the internet oh, great. and you can have a quick read of that but we will be printing them off and handing them out at the talks um, around as well and it's just very simple straightforward stuff and a lot of people kind of saying you gotta I like that I haven't voted in 20 years but I really like the idea of that like you know but you're, yeah. how could you be against it when, it when we say look the people will have the power again you, know? you can't really be against that and look we'll get you on the show to go through that because I think that's important that we do uh, yeah we'll you know, get the brochure off, uh, as I say down and we'll read through it it's, it's nice and short and sweet and straight to the point absolutely and uh, you're coming down to Waterford actually on the 16th uh, of, uh, of June isn't that right it's that's right yeah Project Awaken yeah and what are you going to be talking about there Ben um, just hopefully promoting uh, direct democracy because although we talk about the bondholders and uh, you know we do show a bit of that what ha- actually happened in Ireland and promises made because a lot of people do forget. I mean we show several videos of different TDs uh, spouting out of them before the election. 
Yeah. And I think a lot of people, when they actually see it, go, God, you know, I don't remember him actually saying that. You yeah, know, you forget, people just need yeah. to forget or take it as granted that you get lied to by politicians and that's okay with us, you know. Yeah. So we show a bit of that, but rather than dwelling too much on the past end, you know, because everybody can get up and say, what's wrong with the country? <laughs> well, that's <laughs> but it's the solution, the solution is really it's the, solution. the issue, you know? And that's what we talk about on the show all the time. What's the solution? You know? Yeah, the solution is, is always, I mean, anybody can stand up in the soapbox and tell where it all went wrong. <laughs> yeah, and what I love about politicians, they don't give any solutions, but they have these great sort of PR lines, like, yeah. and we must move forward. You know, this yeah. is empty yeah. phrase nonsense yeah. it drives me insane like yeah. this you know if you say anything about them lying or what they did in the past and stuff, look we can't do it we all have to move forward well you know they've been trained but to that's speak not like a solution that. like yeah. i mean what does move forward mean what we're moving forward in the wrong direction <laughs> they get trained to speak like that ben you know, you know they have pr people that actually teach them yeah well that's it they, they, like. to avoid any sort of controversy or anybody asking you a question I mean, sure, if anybody asks me a question and I can't answer, and I just say, well, sure, look, we, we've got to move forward, we can't dwell on that. Yeah. That seems like a lovely answer, but it's just such an empty phrase. It doesn't actually mean anything. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. Absolutely. You know? yeah, straight language is what you need, especially, I mean, time is short when you're dealing with, you know, in, in, in government and you're, you're trying to get, you know, stuff done. And you, you, the, the crap that they go on with and the, the you know, the, the language <laughs> they use. No, it drives me insane. I never see somebody on the ask questions and ask questions. I mean, like, if I was involved, somebody asked me a question and I didn't know the answer, I genuinely say, look, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, well, I'll find out for you. Yeah, but I find out. But at least that's an honest answer. Instead of just dividing the question and avoiding question, you know he knows the answer. He just doesn't want to tell you what it is. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm a big boy, but it's bad telling what it is. I'll handle it. Yeah. Well, see, what politicians do is they, you know, you, they, somebody asks them, well, what's what's the price of bread there now? And they go, well, I went out to the shop and I saw a packet of sweets and, and I had a look at a packet of sweets and they weren't a packet of sweets I was actually looking for. And then I saw a bit of fruit and I had a look at the fruit and I, you know, I actually bought the bit of fruit. But did you know what? What, what you asked me again? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's how that's how they do it. Like that is the trick that they use, and it's uh, it's very devious. But uh, we need to move away from that. And, and I, don't I know someone actually gave me a good idea there the other day. They said, then uh, on direct democracy, why don't you introduce that if someone comes up with a really good idea, and it could be at local level or national level or you know international level, yeah. that the person gets rewarded if it was implemented. Now I know you get some harebrained ideas. Yeah. I thought the idea was that was that quite good. You know, if somebody came up with a sort of brainwave, it could be just to do with anything like parking or whatever it is, yeah. and you actually implement it, that it was on a reward basis. Well, what you're talking about is a meritocracy, which is something that I that I believe uh, should be implemented in society because people, uh, you know, they, they, they live on self worth and if they have no self worth they actually end up getting depressed. And you need to exactly. you need community yeah. as well. And not only that, though, if an idea is implemented, or even if you gave an idea in and you thanked them for it, but maybe said it won't, this won't work because X, Y, and Z, but if you come back to us, you know, that'd be great. It feels that you're at least involved or has a, have a sense of being involved and being listened to. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, the, what, what, what the, um, the uh, Awaken Ireland movement is actually doing at the moment is, is arranging talks around the country that are community-based, grassroots-based, and getting the community to come up with solutions for themselves. Ben, that's yeah, yeah. Actually, you know, a clan of guilty favour exchange as part of that, you know, the, the local let system, uh, talking about an alternative currency, uh, like social credits, that sort of thing. You know, and doing it from, and sitting down with people and actually asking them, well, what do you think are the solutions? And then you yeah. bring in the lights of the direct democracy into the local areas, Ben, and, you know, you can really actually fundamentally change things. Yeah, of course, yeah. And then you get a sense of work, even, like, if even it's only on a local level, you have a sense of work in your own locality, you know. It has nothing to do with, like, um, uh, pride or anything like that, like in the fakeness of pride, I mean, but just uh, pride in oneself and one's community is, is what I mean, you know, like a self-worth and... Um, even to say to your kids, look, I, I came up with that idea, the benches that you sit on, you know, just whatever it might be. Absolutely, absolutely. And you see that when people are involved, you know, in it, um, like I remember a guy was telling me that in Switzerland one time somebody threw a paper on the, the ground, you know. Yeah. This woman came up, he, he threw it like out of a car, and this woman came up and basically put it back in his window, you know. Right. I don't think you'd ever see that in Ireland, but she just had this sort of sense of, uh, belonging in her own community that nobody was going to throw dirt around the community, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. That's what the town is And that's what we need here, you know? Yeah. Uh, like, even as you drive around the country and you see 
like dirt in the ditches and people throwing stuff out of car windows and all. Just, you know, for other people to toss at that even or beep, you know, and just say, look, don't be doing that, you know. Yeah. We don't have that sense of pride in ourselves anymore because our Irish culture, I think, has been slowly ebbed away from us that, you know, we don't really know what we own anymore. You know, sure, a lot of us don't even own our homes anymore. <laughs> we thought we might have. <laughs> well, that's, that's the problem, you see. What I don't think what a lot of people don't understand, Ben, is that the, we actually still have a provisional government. Which yes. is still in, in that, is that is still the status of our government. It's provisional, and the state is a corporation, and it doesn't really mean it's got anything to do with the welfare of the people, and that, that's pretty much what's coming out now, and it's just a very big company. And of course, actually, yeah. And, and not only that, you know, a lot of people then, when they're uh, facing these corporations, they don't actually realise the power they have, because, you know, man created the corporation. Yeah. Not the other way around. <laughs> exactly. And you can, you know, your creation can never be greater than the creator. Exactly. So, you know, that's why I face them down every day when I can with just my little camera because I know I'm stand, stepping on toes and upsetting people. But, sure. but it, it does, ha if you actually truly believe in what you're doing, it has a massive impact on people around you. And it, and it does uh, upset the apple cart as well in the establishment. You know, and get them thinking because look, we're not, we don't. Have, they're not the enemy here. We're just trying yeah. to get people to, to reevaluate how yeah. they operate. Yeah, but that's what I was saying. Like, there was um, a man there that was being uh, repossessed out of his home, and he was a good little working man, and just ran into difficult times because his business folded. And I sat down with the bank, you know. Yeah. And I was saying to them, like, you know, is there nothing we can do for this man? And they were so unmoving, like, you know. Yeah. And I said to them, okay, so. Who is it in here that actually loses the money? Like, which one of you guys actually go home and cries at night about the money that wasn't paid back? Yeah. See, it's nobody. They're just a corporation. It's just a cold building. Yeah. There's actually nobody there crying. Mm -hmm. You know? And it's to try to get that sense back to them of who they actually work for. They're actually working yeah. for no one. Yeah. It's just a big corporate movement that sometimes goes out of control because it doesn't have passion or feelings and sometimes it, has the, it doesn't have the ability to change quickly with the times. Yeah, well, the problem that we have, Ben, is that it's, it's, a, it's a pyramid structure that we have uh, in the country, and it comes from the very top in Dublin all the way down, it filters down to, to all the communities, where really it should be coming from the grassroots back up the way, and that if you have, you should have local power in the local area, and that Dublin should not be able to interfere with decisions that are made on a local level, say, for example, in Chamore or up in the Midlands where you're living, you know, that it, they shouldn't be able to be able to make those decisions because the local people, if they make a decision for the local community, should be set in stone and that's it. Yeah, of course, because you see, at local level, like, they will know better. Like, when we talk, say, like, our talk in Castle Bar that we gave, uh, a lot of people were interested in the direct democracy movement and they were saying about setting it up and who would they get to set it up in that area, you know? Yeah. And I said, well, it would be much better if you decided among yourselves because how could I possibly know who's the best person in Castle Bar to set it up and who'd be trusted and stuff like that? There you go. I mean, you people would know to make sure it's not an old penophile mole or something. Exactly. <laughs> or exactly. something who would try, you know, take the bandwagon in his own direction, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, among yourselves, you'll see that if it's not as pure as direct democracy, democracy should be, yeah. you're the ones who'll be able to stamp it out. But it's no good me appointing someone in, in Castle Bar because that needs locals. And it's same when policy has been made. How could anyone in Dublin, as you say, direct the proper policy for Castle Bar? They can't. So most lads up in Dublin probably wouldn't know where Castle Bar was. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because people are individuals, you see, and communities are also individuals as well, Ben. So, I mean, if you have to look from that point of view, and the reasons why modern, that modern uh, capital, capitalist society has failed miserably is because that the legislation uh, basically works or tries to work, implement ideas coming from the top for everybody and you're taking individu individuality out of the population and that actually, uh, it, it makes the, the population sick, you know. Yeah, it does, yeah. But, it, but it's very corporate. It's the exact same way with banking or big businesses. It's unyielding to a specific, you know, incident or criteria that may be needed in a certain place. Yeah. Like, it's all right for people uh, in corporations in Dublin to say, oh, yeah, that's no bother to Europe. We'll ban turf cutting. <laughs> yeah, 
Hello, what? Most people in Dublin probably haven't seen turf. <laughs> it was crazy, like. <laughs> but that's coming from again from a, from the pyramid structure higher up again in Europe. That's, yeah, that's about and they don't actually realise like heritage as well as livelihoods, you know, are, are being affected by just that one thing because they're probably you know in Germany or wherever and going. So what's turf like? <laughs> yeah, they yeah. turf, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just that sort of nonsense. But when you think of our fishing rights given away, I know. I mean, even if you run the, even if you run the government as a corporation, yeah. right, which is a, a profit-making organisation. Yeah. Well, if it was being ran for Ireland, the corporation, even at that, when would that be a good idea? Mm-hmm. I mean, if I was the chairman and you were the managing director and you told me that's what you did, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'd be well, having words in the boardroom. Well, I, I've right? actually got a very, a very. So, I mean, corporation or not corporation, some some decisions are absolutely ridiculous. Like, well, you know? I've got a very simple idea, and it's based on what came before, as in ancient Ireland, which you know, the idea yeah. of the local uh, community, right? And yeah. they, what, what lo- local communities had before was they they had cooperatives. That's you know, in, that's in, right, in, yeah, in the simplest yeah. form. They had cooperatives, and, and, and it, the co- a corporation is a bastardized version of, you know, the the, the cooperatives because cooperatives work uh, for the betterment of the community. And then, if you want to have a bigger cooperative to do international trading, you know, well, then you can have that absolutely. But it it, it makes everything a lot fairer for everybody involved, you know. Yeah, yeah. But the clue is in the word, really, isn't it? It's cooperate. Cooperate. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> ben, it's been lovely talking to you. And come here, we'll, uh, we'll have you on the show again um, over next Sure, yeah, and if people watch out for the video, I don't know what it's going to be called. It's probably Ben Gilroy versus Receivers or something like that. Yeah, why not? Yeah. But uh, we'll have a look and see what you think. Maybe because there's a lot of people in business struggling as well. I know sometimes we keep talking to people in homes, but the other people who are in their homes are running businesses trying to keep them, you yeah. know. And they're all in difficulty too. So what, what we might do is we might get you to break down what the language that you use. I'll make some notes and we, we'll we'll get you to break down the language that you're using uh, exactly how you stop this. Guy. Yeah, yeah. You'll see a lot of legal points we raise in the um, in that video about the conveyance and acting and stuff like that. Yeah. And you can see that the receiver didn't even know who he worked for. There you go. <laughs> it's, it's scary, isn't it? All right. Okay. Well, that's it. Thanks very much, Ben. And no we'll bother. T- we'll talk to you soon. See you again. Bye, bye, bye. And uh, that was uh, Ben Gilroy giving us an update uh, again this week. And thanks to Ben for taking the time out from his busy schedule to be able to fill us in on what's going on in his world. And uh, like I said before, hopefully we'll have him on uh, at least uh, once a week, if not every two weeks. Um, always very interesting, always very exciting work that uh, Ben is is involved with there. And uh, look forward to the next uh, edition of uh, the Ben Gazette Paul <laughs> the Ben Live Show we're going to play you uh, uh, wha- a quick track and then we're going to play the final uh, interview of the night and the final interview is with Cathy Sinnott who's an ex-MEP and she is very interested in children's rights she has nine kids Paul is it? So, yeah. nine children yeah and uh, she's come across some very scary information about the the looking the uh, UN are pushing through legislation across the world that takes away and the rights from the parents to discipline their own kids and gives all the power to the state. Paul, it's actually quite frightening, and you get a good sense of this uh, from Cathy. She also goes into the detail about how the EU works, the Parliament, the Commission, you know, the whole hi- hierarchy within that system, Paul? She has experienced it firsthand herself, so um, no better person to talk to Yeah, on this yeah. subject. Absol- absolutely. So, look, without further ado, we're going to play another song here now, and then we're going to go into that. So, thanks for listening again. And now, for somebody, onto somebody who knows who she is and what it's all about, the Cathy Sinnott interview. Absolutely. Um Hold on a second. I've closing down the folder by accident. There, that was, it was actually Whoops. in. So we we'll have to. We've had a, We've had the. As the Germans say, the worm was here tonight. We've something. Yeah. We've had a couple of hitches or <laughs> glitches or whatever you want to call them. It's all gone a bit crazy. Yeah. There we go. Pre-recorded interviews. Cathy Sinners. This is the pre-recorded inter- interview. Uh, I recorded it a w- over a week ago with Cathy. It's excellent. I hope you get a chance to listen to it in its entirety. On Skype, we have Cathy Sinnott, who was an MEP for the South of Ireland uh, for five years. Is that right, Cathy? Five years, yeah. Yeah, and Cathy is on talking about 
uh, the upcoming referendum on children's rights that hasn't, there's no date been set yet, but it's something that's very close to Cathy's heart and we're going to have a, a good strong debate about the importance of highlighting the new legislation that um, is, is coming from the UN, Cathy, is it? Yes, it's all come from the UN. Okay. Well, you're very welcome to the show, Cathy, um, myself and Paul are... Uh, we're going to go through uh, quite a few questions in relation to this. We've been, we've been doing, a bit, doing a bit of research into uh, what exactly what you're talking about. And uh, we, to be honest with you, we didn't know very much about it. Paul, did you know, know anything about this before? Absolutely nothing. It's the first time I've come across it. Uh, yeah, yeah, so... Yeah, so, um, and, yeah go on, Cathy. Well, maybe maybe I can quickly tell you why I know about it. Yeah, go, um, go yeah. Go in on. the... Yeah, in the late 1980s, I happened to have a friend who lived in an apartment in New York. She was raising her kids there, but they actually, they some of them were in school in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And she was, just as a volunteer, she used to kind of go up on down to the UN several days a week, and she would monitor. She had a badge and a pass, and she would just give her time uh, to monitor what was happening in the area of family, life, children. Mm -hmm. And um, she was seeing something happen that was quite worrying to her, and she used to tell me about it when she would visit Ireland. And so I, I kind of heard this stuff, and it seemed like something on the moon, you know, that that there was um, basically what was happening is there was a great head of UNICEF. We've all heard of UNICEF there, the UN's Children Fund. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was this great head called Dr. Grant, and this man probably saved more lives. I mean, in fact, what was said about him at his, at his funeral was that he saved more lives than Hitler, Stalin, and Mao took. Right. And he saved because he, he was the head of UNICEF and he was very focused on keeping children alive. So hydration, you know, clean water, uh, pumps, wells, uh, basic nutrition, uh, good material internal services, you know, that babies weren't dying in childbirth and you know, just he was he was all about keeping kids alive and, and giving them a good start in life. So he was a humanist. But there was uh, well very much. Yeah. And he was he was just a good guy and he had come out of um you know, dealing with things like earthquakes and things like that. So he knew, you know, I mean, we think of an earthquake and we think of emergency services, but there are countries that are live in that state all the time. And, yeah. and he knew how to deal with that. And he was mm -hmm. great. But there was a stream which she was monitoring in the UN that were trying to redefine everything. And they had targeted, you know, I mean, the whole convention on women Mm -hmm. called CEDAW was brought in, and some people love it, some people hate it. I think that it, it may have opened things up for women in some areas and absolutely is the most anti-women document in other areas. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they, they were in, and so they were, they were heading into to UNICEF mm -hmm. and with an agenda that was about state control. It was about UN control, global control, and that was done through their agents, which were the individual nations. Because really in the UN, if you look at their documents, they don't see Ireland as Ireland. Ireland is their agent in this this corner of the world. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? The, sure, it's a corporation. Whatever the government is. It's a corporation. Yeah, absolutely. Kathy, yeah, if you, if you, if you look and I, I would have seen this very much yeah. in Brussels if, if, as if, well. You know, I just pause you there for a second. If, if you actually go to a website called Dunn on Bradstreet, if you type in the Republic of Ireland, what you will find is that Ireland is listed as a corporation as well as the Garda Síochána, the Law Society, the Department of Justice, the Department of Agriculture. Plus, they're all corporations. Plus the HSE here. I have three pages on the HSE alone in Dunn and Bradstreet. Yes. Yes, yes. Well, you know, I, I mean, I would have, I, I haven't been to that website, but I would have known that in Brussels because Ireland was Whoa. never Ireland. Yeah. Ireland was just the north corner, mm -hmm. which they had signs on and, and that was it, you know. And, and they wouldn't even be annoyed when we would look for a bit of sovereignty or, or assert our rights or something. It was more like a you know, an annoyance, like a fly that was buzzing around their head or sure, something. Sure, sure, yeah. What is that silly were... woman saying? <laughs> Pardon? To be like, what yeah. is that silly no, woman a... saying, saying now, you know? That, that'd be their attitude yeah. towards him, yeah. sure, you know? 
Well, we are a minority in Europe. Oh, We're only 4 million out of uh, 250, isn't it? 250 million people in the EU? But it, did, it didn't matter. The, the attitude was the same for Spain or anybody else, yeah. uh, except the biggest. With Germany and France. Could, could you the attitude was could, could you give us a, a brief synopsis of how the EU political structure works? Because you were there for many years, and, no, and people in this country have no idea how it actually works. <laughs> I'm not sure I could do it that briefly, but I, I, I try to be as brief as I okay, can. Okay, go for it. Okay. Uh, the way that Europe works is that the, the council, um, well, the commission runs everything. Mm-hmm. The council, which are our heads of state, basically France and Germany are, mm. are pretty much run that. Okay. You know, what Germany wants, what Germany wants, Germany gets with a little bit of, uh, nodding the head towards France, a bit mm. of compromising towards France. But basically, you know, they, they would say that the council gives the direction and gives the orders and the commission merely like the good servant puts it into effect. But that's not true. Okay. Uh, you know, Germany decides what it wants with whoever, you know, with whatever international interests, etc. The council gives the direction and then the commission, uh, makes legislation, etc. But the reality is the commission is an enormous engine. It's a, it's, I think about a 20,000 strong, incredibly well paid civil service mm -hmm. and and many really good people in it i mean sure. i met people who really cared and, and were really trying to to do things but the mindset is always that they're dealing with this one big country which is this one big block which is part of the world set of blocks if you like mm -hmm. so the commission then will produce legislation and it goes to the Parliament. And as far as I could see, and I think I was in the Parliament at the right time because before Lisbon, you could get a, you could get more done. Okay. Even though when it came down to it, what the Commission wanted, the Commission would get. Mm -hmm. But when you went into who wrote the stuff in the Commission, yes, the civil servants would, would say write the legislation or the policy, but their advisors were the multinationals. Right. And I remember at stage we were having an argument because there was something in, in health and they were going to, um, write this legislation. They were going to review this with a committee they were setting up. And, and for some reason we were given vetting option on this committee. Mm -hmm. And everybody on this committee seemed to have been working for multinationals that had a lot to gain by, I can't remember what it was, but a lot to gain with whatever this legislation would so be. So they lobbied the and legislators, we pointed, so. They, well, they, they, they were going them, to yeah. put these people, these experts, doctor this and professor mm -hmm. that and all the rest, on this committee that were going to advise the commission, basically write the legislation in this specialized area. Mm -hmm. And we pointed out that every one of them had worked for pharmaceuticals or, you know, whatever, multinational. And their answer to us was a very blasé, well, these are the experts. And if we don't take someone, you know, you're not going to find an expert except someone that's worked in this area. Mm -hmm. You know, so basically, uh, it, it's like when we, we expose that the EFSA, which is the European Food Safety Authority's document on artificial sweeteners, that one of the main committee members, if not the head, I can't remember now, but it, one of the main committee members had been lifetime careers working in the artificial sweetener industry. My God, it's ridiculous. And of course, EFSA, yeah, EFSA found that there wasn't really any problem. You know, we should keep an eye on it, but no cause for alarm with aspartame or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, so that, so the, the commission, and as I say, there's some very good people in the commission, and they really try their hardest, but there's a lot of vested interest. So the commission send us legislation into the parliament, and we can vote it down. We also put in amendments, and I used to be putting in amendments all the time, and, um, you know, we can try to change it, but I'll give you an example. If the commission wants something, which 
might mean if a multinational wants it or, or if Germany wants it or whatever. But if the commission really wants it, the commission's going to get it. And we waste months of hard work and lobbying for amendments and things that just get swept away. And a good example, when they were redoing the waste directive, I fought really hard and really lobbied for every last vote to keep incineration as disposal. Mm-hmm. Right. Which meant that there would be a lot more regulation, a lot more, you know, cost to disposal, etc. In other words, if you're going to burn it, you're you're dumping, you're disposing. But the the incineration lobby and industry wanted it called recovery on the basis that they were going to recover energy from heat. Mm -hmm. And we fought that battle and we won. So when the legislation went through to the the update of the waste directive, we kept incineration as disposal. Mm-hmm. And it went to the commission and basically the commission rejected it. Okay. So this time when it went back to the parliament, we needed a two thirds majority to keep it at disposal. And so we worked all the harder, you know, talking. I mean, the amount of talking you had to do to, you know, get the swing votes and to, you know, keep people steady. And, of course, there were lunches being put on and, you know, free pens and all kinds of things about recovery and all this sort of thing. So we managed to just barely get the two-thirds. It went back to the commission, and the commission rejected it again. And basically, it's now called recovery mm-hmm. in the waste directive. Incineration is recovery. So, you know, the parliament is there. And when it suits, I mean, the commission, they might have wanted to do it one way and the parliament do another. Okay, we can live with that. But when it comes down to it, and it's something that the commission wants. The commission gets it no matter what the parliament does. So it's, it's very and like, that, it's very like uh, the veto that the American president has. Well... It's a little, at least the veto is out front and center and you can see it happen. Okay. You know, it, the commission, what they have then is they will have a, an, a, a big meeting. When it comes to a deadlock, they have this meeting and they often go till three and four in the morning till people are worn down and then they agree to a compromise. And the compromise always includes the key piece. Okay. The commission will give some things, mm-hmm. but it always includes key piece. And and I'll give you one I don't want to give lots of examples because I want to get back to children's rights, sure. but I remember in one case it was the night before the seventh framework. No, it was the uh advanced medicines. It it was we had two different pieces of legislation. It kind of basically happened the same in both. Um the advanced medicines directive Anyway, mm-hmm. it it involved things like um, embryo research, yeah. cloning, um, and animal-human, you know, chimeras, animal-human hybrids. Right. You know, this sort of... Nasty stuff. Yeah. You know, Frankenstein, nasty yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I couldn't have put it better. Yeah. Pretty nasty stuff. And mm. we were trying to say, look, that European funds don't go to that. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you know, if a country like the UK have already legislated that you can do that nasty stuff, okay, but, but it won't be done out of European funds. That was the seventh framework directive. And the advanced medicines directive was that it, it just, we don't blend animals and humans. You know, we don't breed them. You know, we don't do that in Europe, you know? Mm-hmm. And we were told, and, and there was good support for that in mm. the parliament, you know, I mean, particularly in, and in fact, I think the reason we were getting so far is that it was one of the things that touched a chord in Germany. Um, sure. you know, in Germany, they still had that sort of memory of Hitler and eugenics. And, you know, he had that breeding project where he was breeding all his blonde soldiers to Norwegian blonde, Norwegian women. And, you know, they had, so it, it touched that chord and, and Germany was a lot of German MEPs were with us on that. Okay. And um, so it had a good chance of success. And I was what was called a shadow on it. So mm-hmm. I was leading the group I was with, which was just a very independent group. It left me free to do whatever I wanted. And I was leading that in this legislation. So we, I was in all the insider meetings. And I remember the commission coming 
the council representatives coming and we were and the parliament we were all sitting around all the leading MEPs with them and they basically told us it doesn't matter how you vote next week in Strasbourg we're going to include this in the legislation mm-hmm. so really don't waste your time wow and that was it mm-hmm. and i and i even said to him so you're telling us it doesn't matter how we vote we're going in next week to vote on this and you're telling us it doesn't matter and they said no Wow. They said, say it any way you like, but that's actually the reality. Yeah, that's not and the first time. the thing is, in the end, we lost the vote. And I maintain we lost it because they made it very plain in the debates that it was going to go through. And so people will, you know, it just, it, you know, it's like deflating a balloon. Yeah. People go away and all your swing voters, well, you know, they don't like to be seen to vote for what doesn't win. Mm-hmm. So, but that anyway, I I I diverge there, but that's kind of the way it is. But it's important, However, Kavi, for people to up, understand what exactly is going on in the background. It's very important for people to understand that. Do you know what I mean? We do need to understand the yeah. processes that are in place and the intellectual bullying that goes on uh, in, in the the larger political establishments that are in Europe. You know. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Now, having said that. Um, I would, the only justification for being an MEP is to be independent because then you can do lots of other things. Like I got some really good research projects, uh, particularly in the area of disability, but in other things and, you know, things like that. You, you can use your position to just really push, you know, advocate for people and, and do all that. And that's all really good. Mm -hmm. But once Lisbeth came in, any wriggle room within the parliament, you know, I, I, I'm not convinced, mm-hmm. you know, that they're, you know, I mean, it was hard enough as it was. Mm-hmm. I'm not convinced that there's that much of it left. Okay. Okay. Um, so moving on then to the, um, you know, the children's rights, which is the main reason well, why. That, I'll, I'll just quickly, yeah, I'll just quickly finish okay. why, you know, why I've been following the children's rights. Okay. Well, you know. This woman, Mrs. Garvey, would fill me in about it. And I was just, you know, this is, I was a mom. I had young kids. You know, I couldn't even imagine this kind of supervision of parents and, you know, the kind of agenda that was building up. And and she was quite worried about it. Mm -hmm. So um, I kind of lost touch with it. And then as her kids graduated here and, you know, I didn't see her as much. And then I went to court. Uh, to the high court in in a test case. It was for my son, but it was really for every child in the country Mm -hmm. that they get the education that they are promised. In other words, the education based on their needs. So that, you know, people, I hear them say, oh, it was an autism case. It wasn't. You could be a gifted child. You could be, you know, a normally developing child. And it was about the fact that you were entitled to a primary education according to your need, whatever that was. Mm -hmm. And that that had been promised, you know, guaranteed, regardless of cost in the Constitution. Oh, I, rem- I remember that no case, agent. yeah. I remember that, yeah. Yeah. So it was the Senate case. But what I didn't realize, the arguments they kept coming out with were, you know, I, I kept thinking, well, that's not in the Constitution. This was a constitutional case. Mm-hmm. And they kept saying, well, subject to resources. And we would say, it's not subject to resources. Yeah. Other things in the Constitution... This isn't. Or they would say, 18, childhood ends at 18. And we were saying to them, well, he's still 18 months in a lot of area. And four years is his highest, you know, uh, rating in, you know, in, in one area. And everything else is down from that. How is he in, how does he not need a primary education? How is he not a child in educational terms. Mm -hmm. And they kept going 18. And we were saying, well, why not 25? Why not 16? Mm. And there were all, there were other things like that. And it was only then when I, well, it was only when I was in Brussels. Um, and, and the funny thing, when the case was appealed to the Supreme Court, the two issues they appealed was the exclusive right of the state to decide what was appropriate to a child. So judges couldn't dictate what a child got, and nor parents. And the 18-year-old, the childhood ends at 18. And this really, I, you know, I, I mean, I could see reasons for it, but none so compelling that they would drag it through the Supreme Court. Yeah. 
So, and then my case, there was a case for me, which I had also won, where I relied on Article 40, Article 41, Article 42, all of them, the the woman in the home, which is actually the carer in the home. Mm -hmm. That's man or woman. Even though it says woman, the, the high court has a good while ago already established it's the person doing carrying duties in the home. So carers, man or woman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we relied on all those. I won on all those counts. Mm -hmm. And they absolutely appealed every bit of my case. And and I didn't understand their vehemence about it Mm. until I got to Brussels. And in Brussels, I found myself, again, because I was the vice president of Family and Child Protection Intergroup, I again was the shadow, the lead, on on uh, the children's rights. Uh-huh. And the children's rights was one of the many bits of legislation they were doing to prepare for Lisbon because, of course, they had put children's rights in the in the Charter of Fundamental Rights in Lisbon. So when we voted for Lisbon, yeah. we locked in this UN treaty on children's rights. And which it's all I, sneakily done and nobody knew which, anything about it. Yeah, and no one knew anything about it. So they locked it in, and when I started to read it, Mm-hmm. And and really went back and read it. I thought, oh, that's what they were doing in the high court. That's what they. These are the words directly taken and put into high court. High court, but they never in court in all twenty seven days of the Senate case and in all the whatever five or six days in the Supreme Court, they never said the word the Uni- United Nations Convention on the mm-hmm. Rights of the Child. No. So then, in in fact, in in Brussels, they gave the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is what this is all about, as an example of one of the, of, of a treaty that the EU could ratify as the EU, as the country, the EU, once Lisbon was passed. Mm-hmm. And which they intended to ratify because it had been ratified by Germany and France and Italy and, and all the countries, but they, the EU would ratify it. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so I went back to that. So I went back to that, and um, it was very interesting because I then went back to Ireland's ratification. And now just to explain to listeners, this treaty was written. It's called the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and if you type that in, you'll get the convention and read it. And read it, and I'll explain the key to reading it, because the language you might think, oh, that sounds okay, that sounds okay. But the, the issue about the treaty is that you had two warring factions in UNICEF when it was written between 1989 and 1991. Mm-hmm. You had Grant trying to keep children alive, and so there are good things in it about, you know, really the children's basic right to nutrition and stuff mm-hmm. like that, which is all good. And you had the agenda side, which was tipped typified by the next head of UNICEF, Carol Bellamy. She kind of was leading the charge there. Mm -hmm. And she, a very radical uh, agenda person, and she was bringing in the agenda that the state controlled children and that parents had to be on on probation, under state supervision, that the parents were not the ones who decided what was good for children. It was the state, and then the parents carried it out. We were agents of the state. Yeah. And so a complete reversal of, if you like, the natural order, the way it's always been done. Um, and and the thing is, and, and then in addition to that, oh, I'll bring up the addition in a minute. So what happened anyways, they, this, this convention was pushed for by the agenda people. Grant was not interested in a convention he was just interested in saving children. The agenda people who had gotten into UNICEF put on a lot of pressure for a, a convention. And a convention winds up being a treaty, a binding international treaty, just like Lisbon yeah. or anything else. And it was promulgated, if you like, in 1992. And in 1992, Ireland had a right to to ratify it or not. And it had a right to ratify it with reservations. Now, what Ireland should have done at the time is said, this is so in contradiction to our constitution, we have to ask the people. Uh So they should have had a referendum if they were going to ratify it. Or, alternatively, they could have refused to ratify it, as the United States did. Or they could have 
No, the, the United States only refused some time later. They just didn't ratify it at first because the Clinton administration knew they weren't going to get it past Congress. Mm -hmm. And it was in Bush's attorney general that, that refused, that okay. told the United States to refuse it. Okay, because he said, and this was an exact quote he told me personally, he said, when I met him in Strasbourg, he said, I realized it was a revolution. It was the end of the family. So, um, but anyway. He, he didn't mean that in a good way, by the way. No, in a bad way. Yeah. You know, this is the end of the family. The state became the parent. Yeah. You know, the, the family no longer was, if you like, the natural habitat of the child. Yeah. The state was the habitat. And, and the family... At, you know, was allowed to carry out certain duties. Mm -hmm. On suffrage, on suffrage. So anyway, um, Ireland, now some countries did put in reservations. For instance, all the Muslim countries said that they would ratify it, in other words, bind themselves, legally bind themselves at the highest level to this convention, except where it contradicted Sharia. Yeah. So in other words, they didn't bind themselves at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And um, the the UK, now in the preamble it mentions the child before and after birth, and the preamble's not legally binding. Mm -hmm. But just to be sure, the UK ratified it on the basis it only applied to children after birth. Nicaragua ratified it on the basis that it applied to children before birth. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, different countries put in different reservations based on their constitution or whatever. Yeah. Uh, the Vatican, for instance, ratified it in as far as it upheld the primacy of the family and of parents. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, in other words, the, they actually neutralized all the, the bad bits. Um, and, and I want to state right now, absolutely, this is not about abuse or anything like that. You know, in the Irish Constitution, if a parent fails their children, mm -hmm. then the state must step in. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're not talking about an absolute right of parents to hang on to their children if they don't take care of them. Sure. It's absolutely necessary that the wider community steps in on mm -hmm. an abusive parent or a, a, a seriously negligent parent. Yeah. And But many parents just need support and help. Mm -hmm. They don't you want, know, they don't want their, their parenting their power kids. taken away from them. Like, Yeah, a lot of kids are being taken away from parents who actually there isn't a problem or from parents who just need help, mm -hmm. you know? And, and in fact, sometimes kids are taken away when they do need to be for their own safety. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about responsible parents. So anyway, what happened is Ireland. Now I only have met one person who was, who saw it coming and she saw it coming because she knew the same woman I knew in New York, mm -hmm. Mrs. Garvey. Mm -hmm. So she saw it coming. She was a solicitor here in Cork, uh, and Daly. She wrote to the government and warned them that they couldn't ratify it. It was way out of whack with the Constitution. They would need to go to the people, and that if they were going to ratify it, they needed very extensive reservations. Sure. And that's the only person that I knew, and she was only aware of it because Anne Daly made, or sorry, Mrs. Garvey in New York made her aware of it. Mm -hmm. So, a uh, very wise woman, Anne Daly. So anyway, we ratified it with no reservations. And it was that same thing of, you know, when you read, we're now bound every three years, our, our, whatever, our minister for children or whatever has to go over to New York and face a committee. And that committee dictates to them what we haven't done yet, what we need to do. And in fact, every wow. time they've gone, they've dictated to them that we need to deal with our constitution. You know, we need to deal with that. We need to tidy it up. We need to make it compatible with their convention. Basically, we need to take, to take away the power of the Irish people away from the rights of looking after their own <laughs> children. And we don't even know this. We don't even know this goes on. And yeah. they're very interesting. Not easy to find, but I have mm -hmm. them all if anyone wants them. I can, I can, you know, give you the exchanges with Brian Lenahan. Absolutely. And, you know, various Irish people over the years. Yeah. Now, so what happens is, so we, we ratified it. We signed it and then we ratified it. Mm -hmm. And it has been sitting there 
And our laws, and you can read this in the reports from Ireland to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, they'll say, oh, we passed that Disability Act, and we passed that uh, Education for Persons with Special Needs Act. Mm -hmm. And there I am in Ireland lobbying with other parents and other groups saying, this is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. You know, children are entitled to education, not if there are the resources or if mm -hmm. the state feel there are the resources. Because remember, even during the height of the Celtic Tiger, the state didn't think it had enough money to properly educate children with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So they never think they have enough resources. But anyway, that's okay. another issue. Or in fact, it's very much an issue. Kathy, just going to stop you there. The uh, we're going to go to a quick song and we're going to come back then afterwards okay. and continue on with Kathy. And talking about the rights of the children in relation to the Irish Constitution and in relation to the UN uh, Charter on Human Rights. We're back again there now. Cathy, thanks very much for coming back onto the show. Okay. Well, just to, just to say to you, it's not the Charter of Human Rights. The UN Charter of Human Rights actually is, it was written right after World War II when people really, uh, they, you know, they had a very different idea. They saw what the state could do. No, this is, this is when the UN forgot about their Charter of Human Rights. And this is called the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And so, if I can just very quickly, um, so that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. But just to tell you very quickly what's in it, because I think that's important. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, Article 2, and I won't go in great detail, but just to kind of quickly, you know, you can look this up yourself. There's a basic principle involved. In Article 2, it, it creates what's called children's rights. I mean, the Irish Constitution talks about the rights of children, but it's always, um, you know, that children as persons, it, you know, their inalienable rights as persons with them. Yeah with an infinite dignity and destiny and all this, you know, the real rights. But this gives children all the rights in this convention. So mm -hmm. the UN are going to give children these rights, mm -hmm. you know, a big Santa Claus thing, mm -hmm. you know, sugar daddies. And then it says that the state must ensure all the rights in this convention mm -hmm. against, and among others, it, it actually lists mm -hmm. parents, Gar legal guardians, etc. Okay, well, just to take you quickly through the convention, yeah. what's in it? And as I say, there's some good things in it that came from the Dr. Grant side of UNICEF. But the other side, Article 2, creates what's called children's rights. Mm -hmm. And children have a right to be free from persecution or punishment or discrimination, etc., the state must ensure they're free of these things. And, of course, they're things we want them free of. But they make them free of these things from, among others, parents. So did you ever tell your kids they couldn't have dessert because, uh, et cetera? Yeah. And it makes them free of these things from parents, from legal guardians, et cetera, among, and other, and mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. bodies. So you can't discipline your children anymore, basically, is what you're saying. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. But then, and the state must ensure that. Mm -hmm. Then Article 3, though, is the, is the real basis that, you know, it's the real thing. It says that everything to do with children must be done on the best interest of the child. Now, this may sound good, mm -hmm. right? It may sound good, okay? And that it is the state, the state's party, which is Ireland in our case, mm -hmm. and it is the state that basically decides mm -hmm. what is the best interest of the child. So you have nine kids like me. Yeah. And you have, well, I have more than nine kids. I have my sister seven as well because mm -hmm. she, she died unexpected. And you maybe don't have a, a very big income or something. Yeah. And they spot your very bright, you know, attractive child in daycare or something at mm -hmm. three or four. And they think, well, this child's really gifted, but will never get the opportunities in that low-income home. Right. So the best thing for that child would be to be taken and adopted out to someone else. Now, in Ireland, we can't do that. We can't have compulsory adoption, but it is in. I've seen the wording of two of the drafts 
of the referendum that's going to be coming. And both of those drafts have mandatory uh, that the state can adopt any child. It that, doesn't give a reason or scary. anything, that's any child. That's very scary, Cathy. That's so, frightening. So the state can decide the best interest of the child. Now, in, in our constitution and in any civilized country, which is basically all over the world, base, most countries, there is a provision that the state can take a child who's in danger from mm-hmm. the parents. But in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the basis for everything, and it stresses everything, is the best interest of the child, the state deciding what that is. And then it goes on to 18, and it commits the parents that they must do everything in the best interest of the child. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I don't know about you, but, like, I have nine kids, Mm -hmm. and I might think to myself, well, uh, it's in my child's best interest to get to go to Italy every year to learn Italian and everything. But, you know, we have nine kids, and we have to make it spread across the whole lot. We have to keep food on the table. and You know, so, you know... Whereas the state will only look at each child individually and say, this is what's in their best interest. Mm -hmm. Then 18 commits the parents to this. And that legally, that's a very odd concept that we didn't sign this. We didn't Mm -hmm. ratify it. We didn't even get a referendum. Yet we have been committed to acting in the best interest of our child, which we do naturally as parents, as we, as we see it. But as the state sees the best interest, we've been committed to the state's decision on what's the best interest. Then you have uh, another one. I think it's 15. I'm just looking here quickly. And it allows, it says that, you know, children have a right to their family, etc., and c- can only be taken by legal procedure. You know, and the state decides that legal procedure. The state decides what, you know, and, and on the best interest of the child, which the state decides. Yeah. So the language sounds great. Oh, a child has a right to their family. But only the state, on the best interest of that child, by a legal procedure it decides on, can confiscate any child. And Christopher Booker, you know, the guy who did such Trojan work exposing a lot of stuff going on in the EU, Mm -hmm. is doing his best to do the same with with child confiscation by authorities in in the UK right now. But anyway... um, so that that kind of completely neutralizes the parents. We're there under supervision, and it says that parents are in charge of overseeing development of a child. So we change the nappies, we pay the school fees, but the state decides what's in their best interest. And I heard on RT or News Talk, I can't remember now, it was about three years ago, one of the times when they were going to, you know, they were, you know, kind of putting their toe in the water about you know, having this referendum. Yeah. And they had a panel with Bernardo's and uh, the Minister for Children or somebody, a spokesperson for them, etc. And in the panel, they made it very clear that once we have the children's rights referendum, we will be able to mandate vaccinations. This was an example they were giving. Wow. There'll be no more personal choice, they were saying. You know, these parents who put their children in danger, mm-hmm. you know, this sort of thing. Yeah. And, and I should... I sh- I should uh, maybe just declare my interest here. My own son, Jamie, who is profoundly disabled, was a vaccine victim. Right. So he was normal, healthy, normally developing baby until until he got his first vaccine. Wow. There are many so of anyway, these cases now also. on the other hand, yeah. So we, we might talk about that another day. Absolutely. On the other hand, um. The children, now, so the parents have been neutralized. They're under supervision, under probation. They get to keep their kids as long as everything is in the individual child's best interest, not the best interest of the family, which, you know, the best interest of the child because the family all has something to eat and, you know, mm-hmm. a, a roof over their heads and all. Um, but then they turn around and they give children five new freedoms. Well, in fact, more than five, but five main new freedoms. And it's these freedoms that make things untenable for parents because in many cases, they're not freedoms parents. They're, they're the very things parents would be kind of careful of. Mm-hmm. And just if I can go through them quickly, I don't know how much time I have and I'm you're really sorry if I'm going time. on too long. plenty of time. This is, this is a very important topic, so keep going. It is. 
So children have, and the new freedoms are expression, information, religion, association, and privacy. Now, they're, they're much bigger than that, but they're just the buzzwords at the top of each. Mm-hmm. So the Article 12 gives, and, and remember, all of these, it commits the state to enforcing these freedoms, that the child has these freedoms. Yeah. So the freedom of expression is that the child has a right to express his or her opinion and have it given weight appropriate to their age and capacity, uh-huh. right? And maturity. Public yeah. or private. So any good parent wants their child to speak up. I mean, you know, we're all encouraging our children, but but we don't ask their opinion in everything. You there are a lot yeah. of decisions you don't burden your children with. You don't with, have the you maturity know, you, all the time, Cathy, to be able to make a decision sometimes for themselves, you know? Oh, yeah, we all, I mean, it's part of parent, parenting that you help children in a graduated way yeah. make decisions. And, you know, in my family, it's called carrots or peas, dear. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you, know, this guy, you know, choice, you know, you give them choices and things and you take their choice very seriously. And as they get older, you give them more. But, but you yeah. know, you you lose your job and you have to move to... Uh, Kilkenny for a new job and you don't say to, to your teenager who you know is going to be very upset at leaving her friends at school, but, but you got to do it because you got to pay a mortgage and you, and you say, look, we've got to move to Kilkenny. Yeah. And, you know, but under this, that teenager, you know, according to her age and capacity, which the state decides, the state decides what say what weight that must be given Mm -hmm. not the parent you know uh the state decides that you know and and this is where we've had cases in europe and the u.s even though and and there's an odd thing in the u.s u.s have never ratified this but the courts have acted as if in many cases as if they have yeah but where where children have sued their parents Mm -hmm. you know because they decided something else and the family made a different decision, you know, or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, and that's the, that's the right of expression. And as I say, many of these things are things parents naturally do, but we do them at a pace that we as parents in our families judge our child is able for, would be good for our children, etc. Yeah. Then information is, uh, article 13. Information and the way it's, and again, the state enforces it. The child has a right to, quote, seek, receive, impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, either orally, in writing, or in print, in the form of art, or through any other media of the child's choice. Right. Now, I'm always encouraging my kids to gather information, but I do put limits on the computer. Absolutely, you have you to. Know, yeah. I, You know, there's common sense here, but the child, this is an absolute right. Now, Mm -hmm. there is, sorry, this isn't an absolute right. There are limits. It uh, does allow for limits, like for public order and things. Mm -hmm. However, those limits, the state decides. It's Mm -hmm. not the limits you as a parent put on in the home. It's the limits you as the state decide this Mm -hmm. can have. Mm -hmm. So... You know, so a parent who wants to limit maybe pornography or predators, mm-hmm. you know, under this, you, you've got to lobby the state to, to do those limits. You can't. Which is completely under this. unreasonable. I mean, you can't get every parent to go and ask permission from the state. That's just completely bonkers, you know? Well, yeah. And, and the thing is that the reality is, with or without this convention, within people's own homes, they do what they do. Mm-hmm. However, if that child goes to a teacher, because of course in countries that have implemented this fully, yeah, um, goes to a teacher and says, "My parents wouldn't let me do this or that." That parent is 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 liable to be in trouble yeah. if not lose their child. Not you know, so. in Germany, which has gone very seriously into this, mm-hmm. has the highest rate of children in foster care in Europe. Wow. Now, is that because parents are bad parents or is it because they have so many of these rules and a child goes and says something at school, that's teacher must report it and, yeah. and, and of course, it's great if you're talking about abuse. We absolutely yeah. want that kind of system. Absolutely. But when you're talking about the fact they didn't let me watch my favorite television program, mm-hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, uh, they didn't let me, they said I can't see this boy anymore mm-hmm. because that's, that's 
part is uh, that's another one of the freedoms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you have the freedom of thought. So Article 14 guarantees a child freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. And it directs the state then to, quote, provide direction to the child in the exercise of his or her right in a manner consistent with the evolving capacities of the child, which is another concept Mm -hmm. in this. And who decides what's consistent, Mm -hmm. what method or what what information or what values or thoughts, Mm -hmm. and who decides the evolving capacity, the state does. Surprise, Mm -hmm. surprise. Obviously, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, so in a Muslim country, this could be used that uh, a child must only be taught what uh, Sikh or or whichever sect in that particular country or whatever. Or we could have Rory Quinn, and he could decide this means that a parent can't, you know, pass on their Church of Ireland or their Catholicism or whatever. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so... You know, so it's it's thought, conscience, religion. Then the next one, Article 14, the state again guarantees the child the right of association and peaceful assembly. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have vetted to a certain extent, you know, the people that my are going to be in contact with my kids. Mm-hmm. You know, like you do kind of check out the teacher and, you know, you, you check out... Uh, certain things. You've, you've sure. got them within reason. You have to, sure. But the, your child, well, absolutely. What, but see, this is the thing. What is responsible parenting is actually turned on its head here. This gives a child the right of freedom of association. And again, parents are going to do what parents do. But there's a provision in this that makes that, it, that the state must guarantee that the children are taught their rights. Mm-hmm. So that the, you know, in schools, you must be taught that you have these rights. So it, it's a, it, it just creates, you know, a conflict within families. You know, I mean, how many parents in Germany? I mean, I had a, a girl from Germany uh, working for me at one time, and she used to tell me that every child is taught every year in school. Every child is taught the number to phone. You know, the child line number to phone. Mm-hmm. So if their parent punishes. Or what, you know, that they've got someone to ring. Mm -hmm. And, um, and of course we want that for, for danger, for abuse, not for ordinary parenting. No. Okay. And then there's Article 16, no child, quote unquote. And this is, you know, the the language is always so absolute. And Mm -hmm. this is the most absolute of all. No child shall be subjected to arbitrary or unlawful interference with his or her privacy family, home, or correspondence. Mm -hmm. And it goes on to explain that this includes from the parents. So, and this is a problem for parents because parents are, by definition, part of the private life of a child. Mm -hmm. Of course. You know, it's not that you're there reading your children's diary, but your child disappears and and you've got to find out where they are. You know, you're you're going to go up to their room and see is there any clue, any mm-hmm. hint. But this whole idea, and this is no child, not mm-hmm. a one year old, not a five year old, not a seventeen year old, mm-hmm. no child. That privacy is the most absolute right in here. And of course, privacy in in other jurisdictions have has been used to. I mean, that was Roe v. Wade was privacy. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Uh, you know, and, and that's now, I, I've limited what I've told you just to the, the hottest of the hot buttons in this. And all of those rights, all of those new freedoms, all of that, and the exact sub, subsidiary position of parents, mm-hmm. this convention says must be taught to children that they know exactly where they stand. Mm-hmm. Well, it sounds like communism to me. And Kathy, that's 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 where we're going with this, you know. It's uh, it's shocking. Well, it's it's not it's North Korea, well, I remember, you know. Well, I, I remember uh, there was a thing called the Lisbon Strategy, at, as opposed to the Lisbon Treaty, and it was the strategy in two thousand that was going to make Europe the most cutting edge economy in the world. This mm-hmm. was the bumper sticker. And the year after the Lisbon strategy, and this was the one where they were going to get all the women out into the workplace and they were going to have full employment of the men and, you know, all sorts of things. All sorts of lies. But the next year, they had, 
Oh, yeah. Well, the next year they had what was called the Madrid or the um, Barcelona Agreement. Mm -hmm. And the Barcelona Agreement was looking at all the obstacles to the Lisbon strategy. And part of the agreement was that every child, that by the year 2010, every child, uh, sorry, one third of children under the age of three would be in some form of child care. Oh, my God. And by the age of three, 90% of children would be in some form of child care. Yes. And, they, and I remember we had debates in 2005 we, for the review. We had debates. And um, I had just had my first grandson. And I was like, you know, and his mom had six months off. And then he, she was going to have to go back to work. And mm -hmm. I was saying, well, you know, this is really written by adults. Because if you ask my new grandson... You know, he wants his mom. That's all he wants. <laughs> sure. For the time being, anyway. But anyway. Cathy, the, 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 what's the solution to all this? I mean, it, it, we, we always like to talk about solutions on the show. So, I mean, for us, the solution is to sure. leave the EU, completely leave the EU completely and to give the power back to local communities again, like it was a thousand years ago, except in a modern That's world. It. You know? Yeah, no, I, I people, people power is the solution. Yeah. In terms of this, the first thing we need to do is to vote no in the children's rights referendum. Yeah. And I maintain that if we vote no in the fiscal treaty, they might be afraid to bring the children's rights because the problem with the children's rights that for them is they've passed a lot of legislation based on a treaty that's unconstitutional, mm -hmm. that the people don't know. About. And so this referendum is like when you go for retention planning permission. Mm-hmm. They can't avoid, they can't afford to have a no answer because they'll have to take down the building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why every time they've mooted it and there's any debate at all, it's disappeared into the woodwork again. They refuse to have a debate on this. Okay. So I think people need to educate themselves about it. It's all about the UN convention. They need to look at the proposed wording, which includes the adoption of any child. And I have met with two constitutional lawyers on this, one mm -hmm. expert in Irish, the other an expert in the English version. Mm -hmm. And they have pointed it out. This is any child for any reason. The state can do this. Yeah. And and adoption, not not mm -hmm. foster. And you might someday get the child back. Uh, in, in fact, in the UK, the, the uh, recently it's come out that 97% of children that are taken into foster care are never returned to their parents oh because God. they can adopt them out. Wow. So uh, so this is huge. It's huge. People need to really understand. They've got to look at it. This is not small. As far as I'm concerned, they they took our sovereignty. They took our money. They mm -hmm. took everything else with successive you know, European treaties. Mm -hmm. This to me, maybe because I'm a mom, this is much bigger because this is they, yeah. they're taking our children. Yeah. Well, Connie, and to that, me, that I, is not something you can. Well, I, you I, can I, I've to. got good news for you because there's something called a sovereignty movement happening all over the world and that I'm one of the people in this country that's helping to yes. educate people about sovereignty and there's a big difference between what is lawful and, and what and is legal, great. you know. And uh, when yeah. you explain to people that there's a big difference between a lawful obligation and a legal obligation, well, then the state, you, you basically neutralize the power of the state as long as you haven't broken any law, which means no loss, harm, or injury to any other human being. And that's where we're sure. at. So unless you've harmed your child, the state has absolutely no lawful authority whatsoever to come near your child. If they do, then you can bring them to court and you can sue them. You know, so yes. you can turn it back yes. on them. So what we have to realize as well is that the state is just another name for a corporation. And once you realize that, well, then it, the power is taken away from them. When you realize you're just a corporation trading for profit and that the shareholders are the ministers and the people working behind the scenes, if that's the case, well, then they don't have really any authority over you once the, the veil is pulled back and you can see the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. Well, yes, and and I absolutely think you're right, and and that's exactly what we need to do. Um, and in this case, it's not just the state; the state is only a branch of the UN. In sure, this case, which is not a corporation. The problem here, yeah, but the problem here, and this is the this is the key, is that the difference between that and taking your home is that 
well, to as great an extent as possible. You can bring people in. You can stand your ground on your home mm-hmm. and, and hopefully retain your home and, and have a standoff. When they take their, your kids, they take your kids. I know. And even yeah. if you could manage a standoff, even if you mm-hmm. can hang on to them, you know, you're going to traumatize them just even mm-hmm. in the struggle. Mm-hmm. So we need to be as smart as we Absolutely. We need to, as you say, understand our sovereignty and our families. Mm-hmm. If we're good parents, if we love our kids, mm-hmm. we're all doing our best. We all have different ideas on how to raise kids. Mm-hmm. But we need to avoid this. And yeah. we've got to vote no. And what we need to do is start letting the state know we're wise to this because they won't bring the referendum mm-hmm. if that we're wise to it. And we need to start seeing all of those laws that they've brought and and we need to open up the in camera thing too because they're already taking children not to adoption but to foster they're already doing it hiding behind the in camera rule right so we need to expose that wizard of oz has to be exposed but we mm-hmm. need to you know we need to play smart because they take your kids you don't get them back yeah well, the Awaken Ireland movement is is basically about helping the people to understand their individual sovereignty as well as national sovereignty, you know, and it's a grassroots sure. movement. And the idea of Awaken Ireland is to help educate everybody on a local level to make sure that sure. they understand their rights, to understand their individual rights, the rights within the Constitution and the power that that gives you. And if enough people actually understand that, Cathy, because that's what we're trying to do, we're traveling around the country, we're given... You know, or talks to people, we're sitting down, we're getting people yeah. to talk amongst You're themselves. Doing- you know? Yeah. Go on, Kathy. I have great hopes for this. I have great mm-hmm. hopes for this because no one has heard about this that it hasn't made perfect sense. It, it's, you know, as you're saying, with the Awaken movement, people are waking up. Mm-hmm. And the reason that this has gone as far as it's gone, I mean, it's been 19 years they've been you know, slowly doing this agenda is because people didn't know. Sure. And, and, and it was hidden behind in camera courts, you know, when it was having an effect. But the minute people hear about it, it's making sense to them. Mm-hmm. And so I think I, I great hope that if we can just like with programs like this, the awaken movement, you know, that the articles I'm doing, a series of articles that are being published in Alive, and then I'm spreading them online. Other people are doing the same. I think that we can, we can not just, you know, make them scurry off with their referendum or defeat the referendum, but we can start rowing back on all the, all the laws and all the policies that they have done, um, mm-hmm. based on this treaty, which should never have been ratified as is anyways. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Cathy, I mean, we'd love you to get involved with this Awaken movement because it's a grassroots movement and we yeah. will be getting yeah. in, getting stuck in locally and helping people to, to find solutions themselves. So people have the solutions at hand. They just haven't been allowed to develop them over time because the, the state and the, the European Union and the United Nations being the monsters that they are, they keep taking away individual power from people. So once we, we, we can reverse that yeah. trend and it's true education and it's true dialogue. You know, and that's the only way we're ever going to get turned reverse things, Kat. You know yourself. You've been in the belly of the beast. You've been to the European Union. You've been member of Parliament. You know how the system works. Sure, sure, absolutely. And you know what? The emperor is wearing no clothes. I think this hasn't been a better time for for you know for people to to reverse their their life situation, their communities, and everything. People are ready now to listen. I think so. And you know. When things are good, when there's lots of artificial money floating around, people, I think it's hard for them to listen, but they're listening now. They are. And I'm happy to do anything I can. I've been actually following the awake, and I, I remember going up to uh, speak with, I think, the group, one of the prototype, proto groups, mm-hmm. oh, maybe a year and a half ago. Okay. And we had a great this long chat, you know, we picked each other's brains and mm-hmm. no, and I follow it online all the time. I follow it. I'm on the email list and I'm just really excited about the Awaken movement. Fantastic. Well, the plan is for this radio show is that we're going to do a live show uh, every Sunday from 12 to half, two, three o'clock. And then we're going to put a podcast up 
on the internet which can be shared everywhere and that's the idea because interviews like this you will not get the time that we're giving you uh, today uh, on interviews uh, like this, this this style of interview because they're just so under pressure all the time Cathy to move on move on move on but if, if you can get give somebody an hour that's like we're right. giving you here you can really get into the belly and get an understanding of, of the core issues that are that, that are so important for, pe- for people to understand well that's right and the thing is for the awaken movement People have to get back to actually going deep into issues. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've all been trained that it's all sound bites and it's all this and don't think too deeply. Yeah. And that's why it's really important to go, you know, mm-hmm. and, and really to get off an interview and then go in and actually start researching it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is there any websites that people can look at uh, to follow up on this information? I, I think they, if they go into the UN, uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, read the document. As I say, don't be fooled by the nice sounding language. Just remember that every provision and it, then it turns it on its head. And I'm happy to, it was very difficult to get all the exchanges with Ireland. Mm-hmm. I actually had to go to the Department for Children to get some of them. So my email is kathysinnott at gmail.com and it's Kathy with a K. And S I N N O T T, and I'm happy to send. Maybe I should send it to you, and you can put some of these documents as a link. Uh, sure, yeah, no problem. Yeah, so that because as I say, it took me months to get one or two of them. Mm-hmm. So I can give them to you. People can link in, and mm-hmm. they can actually read. You know, Brian Linehan explaining. God, God rest his soul. Brian Linehan explaining to the UN that he had to go slowly, that the Irish people are attached to their constitution, and that's why we haven't been able to change it yet. Mm-hmm. You know, and we have no intentions apologies. of changing it except for the betterment of the people, and not corporations. And that's what we really want to hit home: is that there is a massive difference between uh, what you. Uh, a group of people as in they live together on an island and what a corporation is and the agenda of corporations and that's something that people really need to understand, you know. That's right. They That they are human beings infinitely with an infinite dignity and destiny and they should never settle for less. Absolutely. And I have a small piece of information there for our listeners. Um, there are actually 25 registered corporations in Ireland who deal with adoptions. So uh, obviously it's big business here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's small peanuts compared to a country that has fully implemented the UN Convention because sure. then, right now, they're limited in the children they can adopt. Once you bring in, once this referendum goes through and they have completely gotten rid of our constitution on children, then it will become huge business because, you know, we're just, it, it'll be an open market for children. They yeah. can confiscate anybody's children. Yeah, yeah. It's turning, turning. It's like turning us into the film, The Matrix, where the 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 babies are just just uh, energy cells, you know, for 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 the state's profit. <laughs> that's right. But that's the way it's heading, Cathy. That's Cathy, right. Cathy, well, can I ask one question? of the things, Christopher? Yeah, go on. One of the things Christopher Booker has pointed out is that a lot of the, you know, swoop in, make a charge, take the child. Often they're attractive. They're white mm-hmm. and they're bright. Yeah. And they're out of the nappy stage. Mm-hmm. And they're out of the nappy stage. Mm-hmm. Just ready to go to a nice, wealthy, professional couple or whoever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And just slightly off topic there, uh, Cathy, were you involved in, in, in the documentary film The Pipe? Did you? No, have, I wasn't. You were pi- Wait, hold on. The Pipe. Oh, yeah. Did you help, help, this out, is help on out the, Cor- uh, the fishermen? That, oh, oh, Corb oh, Gas? Yeah. Were you involved with that? Oh, I'm trying to remember. I I was involved in several film projects, so I don't know if I if I'm there. I was, but I'm really uh, sure I that that I, that I saw you. Uh, it was in the, the film, the, the documentary where the fishermen came over from Rossport, and they were they were they were going to the U, the, the EU uh, because. Oh of... yes, I brought them over. Yeah, that's yeah, it. I, yeah, yeah, I brought fishermen over two or three times and yeah. brought them right into the commission, and it was great because the commission. Uh, the, you know, when you get to the, the people, not the, you know, not the ones with the big agendas, but the people kind of doing the everyday work. Yeah. They didn't know a lot of the stuff our fishermen had to give them. No, I did a lot of work with our fishermen. Great, great. And how did that work out in the end? 
Well, this is the problem. We were making real headway. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had an open invitation to inform this this inner, you know, clique in the in the commission, and then I wasn't reelected. And and it's kind of like you have all these things that you're just in the middle of, or you're really making progress, and then. It's gone, so I don't know how it's. And that's gone a pity since because that, that battle is still ongoing up in Rossport there with Shell, you know, Royal Dutch Shell, yeah. and they're destroying the oh, ecosystem yeah. there with the the dig, digging up of the pipes, uh, digging up of the the beach yeah. there for the pipes, you know, which is which is and a of course now area. Cork Cork is going to have a situation as well with the new gas find oil find in Cork, mm-hmm. uh, and in no onus on them to hire Irish people to uh, use the, you know, give us any share of the proceeds, really, or anything. Very much the same situation. So Yeah, well, those, we'll see what happens um, those licenses could be renegotiated at any time as well. And this is something else that we're trying to help to educate the people about because I was part of the Occupy movement and that was one of the points that we had highlighted, that the licenses were they were given away under, under uh, Ray Burke, you know, for for uh, for next for a song, basically. But there's no reason why we can't renegotiate. But we can't until the current... And political system is restructured to allow us to be able to do that. Well, because yeah. James, James, there's no question that when they bought those for a song, they knew it was a shady deal. Yeah. So I, I never considered those a valid deal. Mm-hmm. I always have felt that number one, Ray, you know, was selling stuff that wasn't his to sell. Yeah. The people buying it knew they were buying stolen goods. Mm-hmm. You know, at a knockdown. Price. They bought it off the back of a car, if you like, uh-huh. and that there was nothing valid about that from the beginning. And of yeah. course, we can, you know, uh, we can go back on that. Well, we'll get there. So, thank you very much, Kathy, for appearing on the show, and um, we're looking Great. forward well, to thanks uh, for having me and thanks for the work it. you're doing. Well, well, I hope to get you on the show again in the future with, with a further update and any, anything else that you want to talk about as well that you feel is of vital importance for the Irish people to listen in on. Just to send, send us an email, and we'll get you back on the show. Great. God bless. Thank, Thank you very bye. much. Bye bye. So that was Kathy Zinnett there with James O'Sullivan. And uh, that was basically it for tonight. Thanks for listening in, folks. Um, we'll be seeing you next Sunday evening at 12 o'clock with some more info updates, hopefully. And um, it's been a long night. Thanks for listening in and have a good night. Good night, everybody, and we'll talk to you again next week. So from me and Paul, good night.